All right, we are live. Thank you for joining us today. You may have seen in comments from Muslims that uh, in response to, to Christians talking about how Muhammad married Aisha at age six and then had sex with her at age nine, you may see responses such as, well, Rebecca was three according to the Bible, so you're just a hypocrite for making that comment. Today we're going, you probably know that this is ridiculous just on the surface of it, but today we're going to dive into the biblical narrative, see what the biblical narrative actually says about Rebecca, and then we're going to see where Muslims have derived this information from. And we're going to see, as with the Quran and much of Muhammad's teaching, it comes from very late non-biblical Jewish texts. So let me us open us with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time together. We thank you for the technology that allows us to connect with believers and sometimes unbelievers from all around the world. We ask that anyone watching, whether live or on a replay, approach this material with an open mind, that they simply not simply dismiss it because they don't want to hear it, and we pray that this information makes it into uh, makes its way to Muslims who have believed this polemic and believe that it's a valid defense for their religion. We ask that you be with us today, that you guide our discussion, and you prevent us from theological error. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So I already gave an introduction, but would you like to add anything introduction? Uh, Mary, I'm joined by Mary from Too Many Marys today. Nope, that is it. That's a great introduction. All right, I'll go ahead and bring up the slides here. So we'll start by looking at why Muslims offer this expl or why the offers Muslims offer this polemic against Rebecca. Okay, so the reason that they offer this as a functional polemic against Rebecca is that they're by their reasoning, if if Isaac married Rebecca when she was three, then there can't be any criticism given to Muhammad for marrying Aisha uh, when she was six and consummating it when she was nine. Because to them, they believe in that, uh, that uh, Muhammad is the perfect pattern for all mankind. However, there is a vast difference between the theology of Christianity and the theology of Islam when it comes to the, uh, the position of the prophets. So we know from the Islamic sources that Aisha was six when she was betrothed and that she was nine when the marriage was consummated. Um, we know that according to the Islamic sources, this establishes the perfect pattern for all time. And we also know that Muslims must believe that it's acceptable for girls to get married at six and have a consummated marriage at nine at minimum because of the theology of Islam concerning uh, Muhammad's position as a perfect pattern for men. Yeah, and it bears pointing out that this is a, a fallacy, even if even if Christians um, were supposedly taking Rebecca as a, a um example of conduct and even if she was three that wouldn't make islam correct that would just also make christianity morally wrong in the same way right and since they base off of christianity at best this polemic just would if every if we granted them everything they're right about everything then they could only say that oh Christians shouldn't be criticizing Muhammad for this. That's the best they can come up with with this. Um, so the age of Rebecca, in contrast to Aisha, is not given in the Bible. It also doesn't establish any pattern for anyone to follow. There is nothing in uh, Jewish or, or Christian belief that says that the patriarchs are the perfect pattern for people to follow. And no one needs to believe anything about and in, in particular about the correct age of marriage from the lives of the patriarchs. This is not something we do is run after or look for the pattern. Oh, we should be 10 years apart because uh, that's ideal because 
uh, Abraham was 10 years older than Sarah. That's just not something that we believe. It's not part of our belief system to like imitate the lives of the prophets in minutia. It's just not, doesn't exist as a concept. Yeah, absolutely. We, it's not like we go to the example of even a, even a, you know, a hero of the faith like Abraham or, or Moses, and we try to follow their example. That's just not a Christian thing at all, uh, let alone to all these minor figures in the Bible. Exactly. And ready for the next one? <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry. I forgot I was in control. <laughs> yep, you're in control because I don't know how. Um, oh, uh, this doesn't have my most recent one, but I'll just cover it. Um, so in the, what the, I have some big picture things, a too long didn't watch big picture idea for, uh, for all the Christians who don't get all the way through this. <clears throat> what you need to understand is that Rebecca doesn't have any particular age that's established in the Bible according to the scripture. You cannot get an age from the text. What you can get is that she was an adult within the context of her times. Um, there were a whole bunch of different things and that she had the strength of an adult because she gives cam well, camels, water to titten camels, as well as being considered a legal adult. Um, and if you go to the earliest extra biblical sources which we do not regard as having any authority over us which occur um if if you are an early exodus person that would be uh 1800 years after the life of uh of rebecca if you are a late exodus person that would be 1700 years after rebecca is the first source that ever gives an age for her it's the book of jubilees from about 100 bc and it gives the age of 14 and that age is consistent throughout the early sources that 14 was the age <clears throat> and so it, you to get to this magical age, and m most Muslims just don't even know that that there's anything extra biblical. They just are told that oh she's three because someone told me. The informed polemicists go oh this uh, Rabbi Rashi said she was three, and what happened is a whole bunch of legends that were conflicting with one another accreted over a long period of time about Rebecca and about Isaac, and about Abraham, and these were had all kinds of insane and crazy legends attached to them. And one of the legends that developed had some conflicting things in it that would, if you took them all, then Rebecca would be three. That is absolutely impossible from the text and the words that are used for Rebecca, but Rashi took these legends kind of over the text and said that, no, no, she must have been three, but he said, that they did not consummate the marriage until she was 13 because you don't consummate a marriage that will cause harm to a to the wife. So if you go to this extreme case, you still end up with a condition where three, no sex, nine, no sex, 13, <laughs> there's sex. So you're still getting from your from the weirdest source who decided to take all these legends together and like piece them together in a way that they were not originally written to make them try to work together. He still said, no, it's 13 when the marriage was fulfilled according to uh, Islamic standards, because before that you would only call it a betrothal in Islam. So um, we have this uh, situation where even the things that they go to, the weirdest, most obscure things. And of course, later rabbis were just like, look, we're just not going to take this one particular weird tradition that created around it. Let's throw out that one and everything works again and she's 14 again. It's great. So if you take this one, you know, even if you go to this one particular weird moment in time when all these legends were conflicting that had grown up, you still end up with a guy who's saying, no, 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 you can't do that with a three-year-old. You have to wait till she's 13. <laughs> so this is just kind of the... In some cases, you know, the uninformed Muslims are just ignorant and the informed Muslims are dishonest. And that's that's what you run into with Islamic polemics all the time. Yeah, that's a great point, because, uh, you know, we, we always say both parts. They married, married her at six and then had sex with her at nine. The marriage at six, you know, you could argue that that was for political reasons or something. I mean, it doesn't really seem to be the case in Muhammad's, but 
that doesn't necessarily, it's certainly weird and creepy, but it's not necessarily like really gross and immoral. But then the, the consummation at the marriage at nine. So by, by going to this particular source where, where she's three when they're married and then 13 at consummation, they're not actually helping their case at all. No, no, which is very funny. So uh, if, so uh, one of the reasons that they use this whole weird argument as if that would mean that we have to say sex with three-year-olds is okay, um, is because they believe in the impeccability of the prophets. So they believe that all the prophets are without any major sins. Um, so, and I said Islamic law, that's, that it's more, um, it is part of the fiqh, but it's also a huge amount of the Islamic exegetes and things like that. Um, but the Quran and Ahadith both affirm that Muhammad was sinful. So we have in all of those uh, Quran verses, you can look them up. It talks about Muhammad asking for the forgiveness of his sins, the ones he's committed and his future sins in some cases, right? Mm -hmm. So here he is begging Allah for the forgiveness of sins. And it's not just because to be a pattern for mankind, it's because he sins. And there are specific sins that he commits in the Ahadith. For example, he curses a slave girl and like says that he hopes that she dies now and doesn't get older. Um, like he tells her to drop dead, like in anger. And the owner of the slave girl goes to him and is like, dude, what's up with this? Why are you being so hideous to my slave girl? And he said, oh, well, I have this deal with Allah that if I curse someone and they don't deserve it, it will actually turn into blessings for them. <laughs> so some Muslims will say, well, that since it turns into blessings, it's not an actual sin. Sin has to do harm. But that's not what sin means. That's not what sin is. A sin is not something that causes harm. It's something that comes out of the evil of your heart. No, he sinned. And it's very clear that he sins. And then part of the excuse was, well, I am just a human. Well, if he's just a human, then guess what? He sins. <laughs> so if we, uh, yes, Tommy Robinson, I am going to cover all of that stuff, just so you know. So um, we, but in the Bible, there are many examples of things that, where the laws change, right? Um, where things that were not forbidden by God, we're, we're told to people that, that you should not be doing this thing. This is something that I consider not acceptable. And in some cases, not acceptable now. Yes, that's, thank you, uh, Phil. He provided the references for me. Because um, I'm trying not to take like four hours with this. I'm kind of cruising on. But thank you, that is a nice addition. Um, and I appreciate anyone who does things like that in the chat. Uh, so... Even in, in Islam, they'll say, no, 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 they all follow the same rules, but they have Adam and Eve, or Huwa, uh, they have their children, each one had a boy-girl pair, and each boy-girl pair swapped with the next set of twins, boy and girl, and married the twin sister of another boy-girl pair in the Islamic tradition. So they, and right now, of course, marrying a sibling would be it would be uh, incest and is absolutely forbidden, yet that existed then and was permissible at that time. It become, became non-permissible, obviously, when people spread out. Um, and in the Bible, you kind of have similar things. It was normative in ancient Semitic cultures. And by the way, it's kind of interesting. This is actually a proof of, uh, of the accuracy of the Bible because Abraham saying that Sarah was his half-sister through the mother the ancient Semites did not consider in the Bronze Age that you had a true relationship to someone that is that is uh, through substance. Instead, you had a seed relationship through the man and like your substance came from your mother. So if you had different mothers, you had a lineage from the father, but you did not have the same substance. So it was not considered to be uh, incest for half-siblings with different mothers to marry each other. And this was true of all the ancient Semitic cultures in the Bronze Age period. Obviously, God said, hey, you guys can't do that anymore when uh, the Mosaic Law came down. In addition, Moses' own parents, his mother was the aunt of his father. So these are things that became forbidden in, in law. So that shows that the patterns of marriage that are set by people regarded as prophets and 
Islam are do not necessarily become the pattern for mankind for forever. They don't follow the same rules because these rules have not been revealed. This is problematical for Islamic theology, but you have to admit that it's true because of the a example of Adam and Eve. All right. Excellent. Excellent. So we got a comment from Swati here saying that uh, he, meaning Muhammad, was a man of God. All the messengers have made mistakes, not sin. <laughs> so it was a mistake, but it wasn't a sin, apparently. So I guess you have to beg forgiveness for your mistakes. And no, Jesus did not abuse a non-Muslim <laughs> or a non-Jewish woman. Jesus, in fact, used a term. We have uh, actually, we actually do still have two different terms in, uh, well, several different terms in English, some of which are pejorative if you call someone that, and some are not necessarily. So a puppy is not, for example, not pejorative. So it would be as if he were calling her a puppy. It was not a slur as dog is in English. Um, hound is another example that is not particularly a slur in English. You could call someone that he's uh, a true hound for something, and that's not a negative thing at all. So you cannot take things that are slurs in certain contexts and then demand that they be slurs in another context when they aren't. Uh, anyway. Yeah, and I'll just add, you know, look at the the woman's reaction. Uh, does yep. she seem does she seem offended, or does she understand what's going on? And did Jesus predict her reaction and knew how she would react and use that uh, accordingly? Yes, because Jesus was using this interaction as a way to um, to correct his uh, his own. Uh, followers to correct his apostles so he was because they were trying to drive him away drive away the woman instead she he was saying that no here is proof if you go to the end it's proof that here there is more faith than there is in israel you know you guys think that she should be driven away but instead she has more faith than in israel all right so we have some information about the ages of abraham's family in Genesis. There actually is some information. None of this gives any information about Rebecca, however. <laughs> so, in Genesis 16, 16, we find out that Abraham is 86 when Hagar has Ishmael. In Genesis 17, uh, there's, uh, you know, various things in the conversation. We find out that Abraham is 99, about to turn 100, and so Sarah is 89, about to be 90. So, he's talking about the present, that you know he's 99 and that will i be a father at 100 and will sarah be a mother at 90. um ishmael is 13 at this time just by uh basic math when this happens because it's happening when at, at 99 and then we have the birth and which does in fact happen at nine uh, that at 190. then if we go on to uh we have the announcement of the weaning, which was probably at three years old um, from other contexts. Um, and the much later rabbinical sources, there's an open window between two and five, but it seems like in the Bronze Age, the normative time period is three years, or actually the Chronicle, sorry, that was the, the early Iron Age, but it probably was that in the Bronze Age as well. Then we have the sacrifice of Isaac in Genesis 22. So we don't have his age here. We don't know anything about his age, but obviously he's older than weaning. But from the context, he has a conversation like, you know, a, a fairly capable son would have. And we know that he is old enough to carry the wood for the pyre. So he's carrying all the wood, just as Jesus carried the cross, by the way. And he is described as a na'ar. And that word is used for, it can be used from infancy all the way up, well, usually infancy to 20s, but it's most often used for people who are teenagers or in their 20s. It's used a lot for servants. So, like, he had this servant who, and they would just describe, and then his na'ar did such and such. So, it's mostly used of boys who are of, of the age to be, like, a useful servant. Um, 
the oldest person who's ever described that way is Rehoboam, but it's being used not in a non-literal sense to describe his unpreparedness, how he's green and unready. Um, so the youthfulness being attributed to him is uh, kind of a, a slur on his immaturity rather than a literal age here. Um, you would expect just from the word Na'ar with nothing else that the... Uh, and him carrying the wood for the fire, you'd expect somewhere between around 15 to 30, somewhere in that range, right? Maybe a little bit younger, very unlikely to be older just from the context. Excellent. So, um, and I have to wait for it to go up on the other screen because <laughs> I can't read that small. Even with my glasses, I'm like, e. um, <laughs> it's seeing an eyeball. Okay. Uh, and then, and uh, so the next section at the end of Genesis 22, you have a big long section where Abraham is given the news that Milcah bore sons for Nahor. Now, Nahor is the brother of Abraham. So he finds out about these eight sons that Milcah has given to Nahor. Then we find out that the youngest son, Bethuel, begat, and that's the male version of bearing, right? He's begat Rebekah. And then we also have the note that Nahor's concubine bore four more sons. So we have uh, 12 sons and then Rebekah in the next generation. This is just him finding this out. So we know sometime after the sacrifice of Isaac and before the next event, which is that Sarah dies, Abraham finds out that these 13 people in two separate generations exist, and he didn't know that they existed before. So if, so then, you know, as soon as you flip the page, you find out about Sarah's death. And at Sarah's death is the impetus for looking for a bride for Isaac. So, you know, Sarah's dead, and now um, Abraham's like, I want my son to get married. You know, before I die too, I want to arrange this marriage, and I want to arrange the marriage with my own family. So he uh, he sends off his servant, who is usually believed to be Eleazar, who's a servant mentioned in another passage. Um, it's going to be somewhat relevant later. Uh, and she go or he goes to find uh nahor you know one of nahor's descendants he finds uh rebecca to well contracts marriage they come back and then we find out in genesis 25 that that marriage took place after she came back when isaac was 40. okay we still know nothing about it, uh, rebecca's age and we'll go into the details of genesis 24 in a moment but there are no explicit ages here about Rebecca whatsoever. We only know when he found out that she was born. At that same time, he found out that 13 people in two generations were born. <laughs> now, what the low information Muslims do is they say that we find out that Sarah dies in Genesis 23 when Isaac is 37. So that means that Isaac was also 37 when he was being bound. Why do they say that? They just, they have no idea why they're saying this. They're like, he was 37 then, so he must be 37 in the story before. I don't know. Was he also 37 when he was being weaned? Because his age wasn't explicitly <laughs> given them either. And then, and then, uh, yeah. So, and then we find out that uh, this was also when Rebecca was born in the previous chapter because the because Abraham finds out that Rebecca was born between the sacrifice and Sarah dying, which the Muslims just say that that must have happened when he was 37, right? That she must have also been born then. If you are a sane person and reading the text and you say that him finding out that someone was born then means that they had to have been born then, <clears throat> that means that suddenly you have... 13 people born at the same instant or at the same time, all when he was 37, and Bethuel gave birth or bore, or begat rather, he begat in, like, came out of the womb, boom, within three months, <laughs> because they were born in the same year, right? They all had to be born then. So we have, like, he's just one year older than her and still, like, a, 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 a still her father. 
according to this reading of this. And this is a low information Muslim position. It's the one that most of them take. And the funny thing is, they will go straight to the text and they will read these texts and go, clearly she's free. And it's like, clearly you need reading lessons <laughs> because they don't really consider what the le what the text actually says. They only have in their head what they've been told about it. And I guess that they assume that because the Quran is so incoherent that therefore they must be incoherent too. It just like the, the Bible must be incoherent too. And there must be all these contradictory, ridiculous things. So yeah, that's just, so. that's just a stupid, stupid argument. Don't make that argument Muslims. It just makes you look stupid. Yeah. Some fascinating material there, especially that all these people were apparently all born at the same exact time because, uh, and, and as you pointed out, it, including uh, people who are directly father, daughter related to each other. They were born at the same time. No problem there whatsoever, because at least as far as the narrative's concerned, that's when these people are first introduced. So that means that's when they were born. Yeah, it, it's completely, completely ridiculous. Um, we can go ahead and move on to the next one. Yep. So we find out that there's a an entire chapter that covers the narrative of her getting married and in this chapter she is given three different names she's given actually all the names for young women the first one is uh naara and naara oh is my audio bad i i don't Phil said refresh for sound, so I think oh, okay. it was probably okay. on. Oh, okay. Okay, I think it was them. On, Good. On okay. End, yeah. I was just making sure. Um, so, Naara is a uh, is a word. It's the feminine of Naar. However, while Naar is used for a wide variety of ages, um, Naara always seems to be used for someone who is at least capable of being a servant girl. So it's not you, it's, it, there's not a single instance of it being used for an infant. <clears throat> there's not a single instance of it being, being used for, you know, uh, a married woman with kids either. It's the, you know, it's the age of, you know, at least being a servant -y age, which were typically young women, because very often when you'd have a servant, she would later get married and then she wouldn't be your servant anymore. So um, this, uh, that's a whole, a whole different subject about how those sorts of relationships worked. But uh, the next word that was used is uh, betula, um, which I may be pronouncing wrong. Um, but that word means a virgin or a ma maiden. And this word is used uh, consistently in a number of contexts. And it's very interesting because it, it is the most common word that is used for uh, for uh, <clears throat> young women of marriageable age, because it's very often paired with the word uh, bahur, which means, which literally means young in the masculine, but it was used over and over again of young men of fighting age, which is explicitly established as being 20, ye 20 years plus. So this Bahar Batula combination is used in a lot of places. Um, and it's used in contrast to old people in Second Chronicles 3617. And it's used as the normative term for a marrying couple in Isaiah uh, 62, 5. It's used as males and females of similar age in Jeremiah 51, 22. So this this coupling together, the Bahar is the equivalent to the Betula. So it's frequently used of a betrothed woman and once of a young married woman, in fact, in Joel 1.8. But this Betula is never a little child. Um, there are explicitly five groups of people being mentioned in Ezekiel 9.6 to cover all, all ages of people. So old men, young men, that's Bahar again, uh, Betulas, so that's your young woman, then women slash wives, it's the same word, um, so the uh, married women who are above the age of being Betula, and then children, which is literally little ones. So that's all five groups of people. You have the matrons, you have the, uh, you know, the, the folks who are elders, and the, you have the 
young virgin women and the young uh, warrior age, you know, prime warrior age men, and they're all they're all put together. So <clears throat> the uh, although in its most inclusive context, the word little ones can extend up to at least age nineteen. It is usually used for children younger than that. Um, in this case, the word Batula is being used in contrast to the term little ones. To, so whenever you divide out the groups and you go, well, here are the kids, the little ones, and the young people, the Betulas slash um, Bahers, and then the older people, and that's the old and the, the wives, right? The matrons. <clears throat> so there is another term that is perhaps even more instructive, which is Alma. And this is a pretty rare word in the Bible. Um, what it, it comes from a root that means those who are like hidden away in inner rooms. Um, and very often refers to in other languages that is borrowed from to like uh, noble folks, to noble young men and women, those servants of the palace or the children of the palace um, who are in service to the king and who are uh, of that young adult status before they get married and who are again uh, virgins. So Alma is used of Rebecca here. It's explicitly used of Miriam watching the infant Moses in Exodus 2, uh, 8. It's also used of uh, tambourine playing women who are part of the royal slash temple entourage in Psalm uh, 68, 25. And it's also used of that same group of royal type uh, temple women in Song of Solomon 1, 3 and 6, 8, which is a group that is in contrast to the concubines who are not virgins. They're the ones that that, that uh, the king has has slept with these they've spent the night with the king who are in six eight and they're also in contrast to the wives um who are also mentioned in six eight so it's also used of a bride on her first night with her husband in proverbs 30 19 and finally of the virgin who will bear a son in isaiah 7 14 so <clears throat> this uh this connection to royalty temple type things is very instructive with, uh, you know, it's it's so set that in fact the playing style of these uh, high-ranked virgins are used as a musical term in several places uh, because this is such uh, you know a known a known phrase. So this is a title that is given to uh, Rebecca to indicate not only her virginity but also her. Uh, like her status, it's a ter term essentially of respect and status and things of that nature. Absolutely. So the so these terms combined, they kind of narrow the age down to uh, teenage, young adult type age. None of the terms is like, so the, there's always difficulty. Um, and that's mm -hmm. why there's the confusion over Isaiah and, and people claim that it's a mistranslation when it's translated virgin. Uh, they're wrong, by the way. Yeah. But but um, the the because the categories that the ancient people had in their mind aren't exactly matching modern categories, it, it's always you know some ambiguity on the edges. But we can say for sure that these narrow it down to being uh, old enough to have children, old enough to get married, but not uh, you know like in your thirties for sure. Yeah. So it'd and be like teens, yeah. early twenties at the most. Alma seems to indicate even uh, a distance even from the idea of betrothal, for example, like totally unattached is kind of how it seems to be used most often. So um, we also have, so, you know, that is the overall all terms that are used there. And now I'm going to go ahead and, and just read Genesis 24 so that folks like we have the narrative in our mind while we're going through this. So let me go ahead and pull it up and I'll read it very quickly in, let's just do BSB because it's easy to read aloud. So uh, Abraham first sends his, uh, sends his servant with 10 camels and he gives a prayer. He says, Oh Yahweh, 
God of my master Abraham, he prayed, please grant me success today and show kindness to my master Abraham. Here am I staying beside the spring and the daughters of the townspeople are coming to draw wa out to draw water. Now it may happen to the girl to whom I say, please let down your jar that I may drink and who responds drink and I will water your camels as well. Let her be the one you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you've shown t kindness to my master. Before the servant had finished praying, Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor. The, the girl was very beautiful, and she was a virgin who had not had relations with any man. Uh, she went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. So the servant ran to meet her and said, please let me have a little jar I love water from your jar. Drink, my lord, she replied, and she quickly lowered her jar to her hands and gave him a drink. After she had given him a drink, she said, I will also draw water for your camels until they have had enough to drink. And she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran back to the wild to draw water until she had drawn water for all his camels. Meanwhile, the man watched her silently to see whether or not the lord had made his journey a success. And after the camels were finished drinking, he took out a gold wing, ring uh, weighing a buck a becca and two gold bracelets for her wrist weighing 10 shekels whose daughter are you he asked please tell me is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night so this yeah you know, we're just gonna stop here for a moment and talk about what's just happened so she has gone out to carry the water and there there's a particular word a uh, cod that is used of the jar that she carries water in. And just like we have stock pots and saucepans and saute pans and those various things denote a range of sizes. Like you can have a, a large a large saucepan, but it's not gonna be as big as a stock pot, right? You can have a small stock pot, but it's not gonna be as small as a large saucepan. They just don't really overlap. So also the word cod is indicative of a particular type of uh of uh uh jar a specific style and a specific size it was the normal term for a storage jar used in that area that was large for water or for uh or for grain uh flour so you're expecting your big water jar and your you know, your big thing of flour is going to be in this type of jar. And if we can go back, we can look at what the jars look like. Um, whenever it was translated from Hebrew into Greek, they have the same kind of distinctions in Greek. Oops, previous one. Um, yep. it, it, we have the same kind of distinctions in Greek. And we have the word uh, hudria or hydria, if you're pronouncing it the way we kind of do now. But um, uh, the... And that would be a water jar. And that's about how big they were. Because all these different cultures, you know, they had lots of jars and they needed words especially for this book of jars. So this would be a water jar. Here you see the size of a woman together with the size of a hydria. And you can see that a little bitty girl could not be carrying this. You have to be at least a teenager to haul one of these things. Even the jar itself is heavy. So in, uh, in the next slide, we can see uh, what the cod uh, that is still sometimes used, uh, the basic form hasn't changed very much, would have looked like then. These are uh, uh, Muslim women actually hauling water out from, uh, from a spring or a well somewhere. So you can see here how large these jars were. Yeah, it's it's almost the size of a three-year-old. This is not something, just a jar. The three-year-old can't lift the jar. And so the idea that this three-year-old is running around lifting this jar is absolutely absurd. Now, we also have the issue of the camels and how much the camels drink. Now, I there, there are a lot of things if you just go, how much do camels drink? You'll get tons of different reports you know, uh, responses. I tried to find an authoritative one, and then I took half that much. So in the next slide, we can see how much water the camels would have drunk. <laughs> Each one of those represents her going there once. It could have, it very much, if a camel had just been like 50% thirsty, so 50% 
what the maximum of what a camel drinks in a short period of time, then it would have taken 60 of these, these jars, which are probably about two and a half gallons. That's how large old water jars typically were. Um, and it would have taken 60 of these suckers to fill up these camels. Um, this is because, you know, uh, a thirsty camel drink about 10 gallons and about or excuse me, 30 gallons in 10 minutes. That's less than some numbers that I found. But I went conservatively. And if you're cutting that to 15, you end up with 150 gallons, which weighs 1,000. 252 pounds or 568 kilograms that that this tiny little three-year-old is supposed to be giving these camels so i just wanted to show every single one of the every single time she went down and back up and down and back up because she had to go down to the spring because it was it was in some sort of depression it was not a well where you just dip or even where you let down a bucket she had to walk down to it and come back up from the description. Yeah, you know, this is totally absurd, of course, that a, a three-year-old or even a nine-year-old could carry this much water. So um, going back to the uh, narrative of Genesis 24, um, so she finishes watering all the camels. And, you know, he... he recognizes that his prayer was fulfilled um and uh so after he asked whose daughter are you he asked please tell me is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night she replied i am the daughter of bethuel the son of milka that milka bore to nahor she added we have plenty of straw and feed as well as a place for you to spend the night. Then the man bowed down and worshipped Yahweh, saying, Blessed be Yahweh, the, the God of my master Abraham, who has not withheld his kindness and his faithfulness from my master. As for me, Yahweh has led me on a journey to the house of my master's relatives. The Lord, or excuse me, uh, the girl ran and told her mother's household about these things. Now, Rebecca had a brother named Laban. He, when he rushed out to the man at the spring, as soon as he saw the ring and the bracelets on his sister's wrists and heard Rebecca's words, he said, this man said to me, uh, and heard Rebecca's words, the man said, uh, the man said this to me. He went and found the man standing by the camels near the spring and uh, Laban invites him in. Uh, he, the servant and the other servants accompanying that servant go in they have uh, a meal and then after the meal it, this is all part of a uh, kind of eastern tradition that you don't discuss business until after the meal um, and so then he now that this is already settled he can finally get to his business and he can say uh, 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 you know the, the meals in front of him but he it sorry it, it's typical that you do not conduct business until after the meal, meal but the uh, servant is so eager to do this that he disrupts what the normal order of events is to do this. So then um, he's like, you know, I, I want to get this out of the way first and tells him about Abraham, tells him uh, about him wanting to marry him, and then uh, re recounts the same story again. And if you go way down there, he says, uh, now if you will show me kind kindness and faithfulness to my master, that is by letting, uh, giving permission for uh, Rebecca to marry Isaac, tell me, but if not, let me know so that I may go elsewhere. Laban and Bethuel answered, this is from the Lord. We have no choice in the matter. Rebecca is here before you. Take her and go and let her become the wife of your master's son, just as the Lord has decreed. So they give their permission. Um, however, if we notice on the, uh, as we scroll down, we find out that in fact, they said, we will call the girl and ask her opinion. They were called Rebecca and ask her, will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. Now, all of these things are, uh, important. She, uh, you know, she gets her servant girls together with her nurse, it says in another place, um, that the, the woman who had been her wet nurse as a child also went with her. Now, the Muslims will go, oh my goodness, she has her nurse with her. Why does she have her nurse? Because the nurse is her slave. 
because these cultures had slavery. So it's not because she needed to be breastfed. It's because she had a number of servant girls, including her nurse, who was usually a fairly highly positioned. Uh, uh, it was a highly positioned uh, st uh, status among the, the the slaves and a respected position because they were kind of uh, the instructor, the governess, more or less, of the girl and her youth and would continue with her if she was well enough off. So he looks up, uh, you know, they're coming in with a servant. Rebecca looks up, she sees Isaac. And when she does, as they're approaching, um, she gets down from a camel, asks the servant, who is that man in the field coming to meet us? Um, and the servant answered, it is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself because at this moment she is showing that she is now a betrothed slash about to be married woman. And girls who weren't married did not cover their hair at all, but the married women did as a signal of marriage. And so then they got married. Um, all, none of these things here, none of these details actually fit with a, a child, a small child. Nothing does. Um, you have all of these activities and also the speech that shows that she was not, in fact, a child. You have the words. Um, if we can jump to the next slide. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, we have all the words of her conversations where she is <laughs> saying, please give, uh, so the servant says, please give me a little water drink from your, from your jar. And she says, drink, my Lord, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. Yes, three-year-olds speak like this all the time, right? Uh, tell me who you are, etc. I am the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. We have plenty of both straw and fodder and room to spend the night, is her reply. After this, she ran on her own to tell her mother's household about these things. Then there are the various interactions. And finally, she is consulted. Her consent is given. Because when she takes the, uh, when she takes the gifts of the rings and jewelry, that itself is a kind of consent. Um, but she is asked for her explicit spoken consent as well. And she says, I will go. Um, when she sees Isaac... She gets down from her camel herself, and in fact, the word that's used there means that she gets down really fast. So she may have just like slid down from the camel and not even told it to kneel, right? And she says, you know, who is that man coming to meet us? So we have these interactions that are entirely appropriate for adults and do not fit at all with for any kind of child. So next slide. So we know now that she is an adult in her uh, in her age because she's called uh, Betula and Alma. Uh, she's an adult in her strength because she hauls more than 1,200 pounds of water out for the camels. Again, that's over uh, uh, 560 kilograms for us non-freedom unit people. Um, she's an adult in speech. And she's also an adult in authority. She's a legal adult because her consent is requested before she leaves her mother's house. If she were underage and this was a betrothal that was being done, um, that would be consummated later, her consent wouldn't need to be asked. She, she would not have the authority to consent, nor would she even be asked in that culture. So, uh, next well, one. Well, yeah, I mean, that, oh, yeah. that's, that's uh, pretty odd in and of itself from a Muslim perspective. I mean... <laughs> No one gets to. No woman gets to be asked her consent, regardless of her age. Right? It's up to the father. Yeah. No. No virgin is ever asked her consent. It's always arranged by the, uh, by the uh, father. Period. Yep. So, uh, we also have other Old Testament references that just kind of talk incidentally about the correct age for people for marriage. Um, we begin in Genesis where we have, uh, uh, for the, 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 this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they will become one flesh. Um, the wife is called a corresponding ezer, which means help, not in the sense of a little assistant, but rather, in every other case, it is given for uh, God himself is the only other help that men have other than their wives, according to the text. Anytime that it says in the Bible that you, that 
you have a help. That help is either Eve or it's God. Um, the a purpose, aside from the, you know, the leaving his father and mother, uniting and becoming one flesh is how a marriage is supposed to be. But you, the purpose of the marriage was for ruling and procreation. So she has to be fit for ruling. That requires you to be an adult and to procreate. So now, uh, Sawadi, we do not have in our culture or in our religion the idea that one specific age is the absolute age minimum for marriage for all time. We do absolutely have the idea that it is the minimum age of marriage for the person to be an adult in with the context of that society. So it is always in Christian in any any Christian country that puberty is a given because you are not you don't meet the minimum requirements of fulfilling the ability to rule and procreate even in the large you know it's not like if you happen to be infertile you can't marry that's terrible no not at all but rather the normative condition that you should be married when you would normally be able to fill these duties um so in the ancient uh in, in the context of the very early iron age and late bronze age of moses that moses came out child marriage just wasn't a thing it was not a thing it did not exist because to be able to be married you had to run a household and that's incredibly important and so that would and it took a lot of work it was some of the reasons there were special protections for women in lots of traditional societies because the incredible overhead at running of running a household in the context of a pre-modern society where you have to uh, maintain the household fire you have to you know your husband might uh, cut the wood but if you're talking about this context she's probably gathering dung for her own fire she is um, because they don't have that much wood she is making the bread every day which is time consuming she is milking the animals she's um, cooking the meals which take a lot of hours if you're doing it from you get a body without skin on it and you start from there and that takes a really long time all of these things were very time consuming and difficult and you also have the issue yeah uh, watering the household is traditionally the duty of the of actually most typically the if you have a teenage and married daughter that's her job that is like the typical job of a young woman who isn't married like completely stereotypical job in the past that once you get strong enough to do that that's the main way you help your mom is to go out and get the water for the household that's that that's a kind of a, a milestone in your growth in in a household and part of your position another thing that they did is they wove all the fabric for the rough needs of the household so if they were tent dwellers they made all those black tents that you see that the bedouins have they made them out of goat hair that was the job of the woman who lived in that tent is that she was constantly weaving to make new ones um she would weave all the rough and basic fabric too for standard needs not the pretty fabric that you had if you were rich but all the basic needs the woman would have to do that. And you actually see that, interestingly enough, in Mohammed's marriage to Aisha, that this was a norm because Aisha is set up in her own household and there are a hadith about how Aisha was unable to be a good wife in this way. She would let a pet sheep that belonged to the neighbors break in and eat the dough because she was just a little girl. She was just a little girl. And so because she was this prepubescent little girl, um, she was, uh, she just didn't, wasn't able to be responsible. She didn't cook well, and that was a point of contention with her because she had, did not live in our mother's household long enough. She didn't manage her household well. She didn't watch the bread well because she was a tiny child and should not be married to anyone. And this is, 
And this shows you that Mohammed truly really was the innovator in the culture, in his own culture. He was an innovator. No one else had done this because no one else had little girls in their own houses. Even if you had betrothed someone before and you brought, you know, brought her into your household and raised her with your sons, she wouldn't be going out and managing her own household until after the consummation, which would happen after puberty in that context. So Mohammed brought in the idea of this prepubescent marriage with sex, with consummation, not just a betrothal, but consummation. He innovated this in the Arabic society of his time, in the Arab society of his time. That was his innovation. So, um, so we have some specific places in the Bible that kind of just glancingly mention just because it never would have occurred to them to marry off children, nor did it occur to the Arabs before Muhammad to marry off children um, and consummate marriages. But uh, we have glancing references to the maturity necessary before someone can become an adult. So in Song of Solomon 8.8, 8, we find uh, that we ha uh, have the voice of the uh, women saying that we have a little sister and she has no breasts. What shall we do with our sister on the day when she is spoken for? So it's saying that she is not yet ready for marriage, yet when she develops and becomes developed, she will become spoken for. That means betrothed. So right now she's not even betrothed. If you go on in the next verse, it starts talking about the beloved of or the, the, the Shulamite of uh, Song of Solomon, who is the bride. And in contrast to the little sister who has no breasts, her breasts are like towers. You can't tell me that towers means like, oh, first sign of puberty. No, she is fully developed. Her breasts, in contrast to the unbetrothed young girl who has not yet reached that age of betrothal in that context, she has breasts like towers. This is a very clear picture of how developed a woman would be. So, and if you go on to Ezekiel, it's really funny because Muslims will actually cite this part of Ezekiel and try to pretend it says the opposite. There is this very poetic section where God is calling uh, Israel uh, an abandoned baby girl that he protects and then marries. And he says that I made you flourish like a plant of the field and you grew up and became tall and arrived at full adornment. Your breasts were formed and your hair had grown. So now you're tall, full adornment. So you finish growing. You're full height. Your breasts are formed and your hair had grown, yet you were naked and bare because this is an image of a child who's thrown in the field. When I passed by you again and saw you, behold, you are at the age for love. So even now, fully grown adult height, at full adornment, the breasts are formed, hair grown, past tense. Right there, that still is not the age for love. That is the age for marriage. Instead, he has to pass by again. And th this entire section is about a series of passings by. First, there's a baby, then grows up and is fully grown and then is ready for love. So you have this break. And it's so funny because Muslims will go, oh, see, see, all you need is puberty. This is not actually what this is saying. This is saying that puberty is the first sign. And then a point after that is when is the optimal age for marriage in this imagery. So uh, you have this, uh, and and yet they'll say that oh oh you know that shows that the instant puberty reaches that's what that's what it says in the Bible when it says the opposite. Not only that, that is not what Aisha was. Aisha was prepubescent. She was playing with dolls because dolls are images which are only allowed to the prepubescent who are considered to not have the mind to commit sin they're not they are under the age of accountability because of the undeveloped level of their mind so he was marrying someone who in his own system had an undeveloped mind and was incapable of sin and yet apparently was fine for him to jump on top of so uh, a Sawadi, I don't particularly care what the Talmud says, and that's actually completely wrong anyway. But <laughs> we will go. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. Don't worry. Don't worry. So, uh, 
So Swati has some theories about Aisha reach, reaching puberty. When would you like to address those? Would you like okay. to? Okay, so we can we can address that now. There is one particular um, uh, ah hadith or one particular hadith that is mistranslated. Oh, that yeah. says yeah. <laughs> that says that uh, I I have seen my parents following the Islam since the age of puberty that's not what I, it actually says and no honest translation says that it is i have seen my parents following islam since i could remember ever yeah, since i could like... remember is what it says now in some day in some contexts you so... can use the word like i came to my full mental status as a a parallel for puberty because that is the age of accountability in islam However, this usage would be incorrect in the, in the words, Islamic words are not being used in the correct way for that to be the meaning. It literally says, ever since I could remember, not since I was of the age of forever, yeah, it does not have anything to do with, with puberty. It's, you know, ever since I could remember, I have seen my parents following Islam, which would be true because they began to follow Islam like before she was born, right? So uh, according to a lot of uh, traditions before she was born. So yes, ever since she could remember, she saw her parents following Islam. Um, the uh, There's a difference between ever since I could remember and when I attained the age of knowledge, like the the grammar doesn't even work there for the for reading it as ever since I have attained the age of knowledge because it doesn't say that it just says ever since I remember. So you can play games, but almost all there the Arabic is still there, still means what it means. Almost all the translations are honest except for this one, which is ridiculous. Um, so there are way too many times in which there are where. Um, there are things, for example, where it says that she saw Ethiopians playing with spears in the courtyard and uh, Muhammad hid her in his cloak. And that will let you know at what age a little girl is allowed to see amusements. And there that word again is used for pu prepubescent girls. So if you type in Ethiopian courtyard, maybe, or uh, mosque. It should show up. Let's see if it. Nope. Try Ethiopian. Wait, well, oh, help you spelled it. Spell right. <laughs> <laughs> you could also do Ethiopian, possibly cloak. Um, Is it this? While well, I was looking at the Ethiopians are playing. Yep. So you can mosque. see may deduce from this event. Uh, so you may deduce from this event. How a little girl who has not yet reached the age of puberty, who is eager to uh, enjoy amusement, should be treated in this respect. So, she was screened. Uh, Jay Diaz, you can come up later, just not at the moment. Wait till we get through this. Um, so, she was screened by his cloak because... Little girls, tiny little girls, are eligible for marriage, and so they have to be screened from male eyes, right? But she's allowed to see things, uh, and she can by being screened. But again, this is, uh, you may deduce from this event how a little girl who has not yet reached the age of puberty, who is eager to enjoy amusement, should be treated in this respect. So while the, uh, who has not yet reached the age of puberty is a gloss, the term little girl there demands that that little girl be, in fact, below the age of puberty. So Excellent. Uh, there's also the fact that, again, she was playing with dolls, and you can only play with dolls if you are below the age of puberty. And there's a story about Muhammad coming in on her after their marriage and seeing her with her little friends playing with dolls and saying, no, no, it's okay to play with the dolls because she still had not reached the age of puberty. And according to most of the exegetes, this event occurred when she was 14 years old. Now, some 14 year olds, they'll play with younger kids with dolls just to be like friendly. You have a, a wide age range of friends, right? And you're playing along with the little kids, right? But if she's playing with dolls herself to have fun, then this means that she was so damaged 
by this early marriage that she was stunted in her development and was still playing with dolls at an age that no mature, no normal 14 year old would be playing with dolls. So, uh, yeah, yeah, so just- Nikah, no, no, Nikah does not mean a process of marriage. Nikah means that the man takes his thing and puts it in the woman's. That's what Nikah means. That's what it means in Islam and in the Quran. Okay? It does not mean that it's an asking to accept marriage. It means consummation. That's why you have the phrase in Arabic about nikah of the hand, which is a euphemism for a certain activity that many men indulge in. Uh, <laughs> you are not marrying your hand. You are doing something else with your hand. So, uh, next one. <laughs> okay. So just just to summarize before we, we get back to the presentation here, uh, Swati actually didn't even know what the the hadith was. Uh, I had it prepared up. He eventually found the wording and gave us the wording. Um, but for a while, he th- he had the wrong reference number, and he kept telling, insisting that it was this. And the chat was like, "You're you're making stuff up. That hadith doesn't support you." And eventually, he posted this. So then we figured out which hadith he was talking about before even pulling this up. You already knew what he was going to go to. Yeah, and because as- I always do. And as you point out, this is definitely a mistranslation. He made a comment, can we look at the original language? Well, you know, here's the Arabic. I've already put up the comment about what the Arabic means. And here's Aisha Buley's translation. You said other translations get it right. And indeed, she says, I have no recollection of my parents doing anything but following the Dean of Islam. And in context, that makes way more sense than in her randomly referencing hitting puberty before her parents uh, or in reference to her parents following Islam. It's clearly, she's saying, as long as I can remember, my parents were Muslims. Not, oh, uh, for no particular reason, I'm just gonna mention that I I had achieved puberty when my parents started following Islam. And if I I, uh, remember correctly, uh, Aisha was an infant when her parents, when her father began to follow Islam, which, I don't even think she was born yet. According yeah, she to might not most have even of been a, born. Yeah, according to most, because Abu Bakr, of course they make the uh, Khalifas like really early followers, because of course they do in the tradition. But if you take the traditional time of his conversion, it would be before she was even born. So, yeah, that would be indeed ever since she could remember, because they converted before she was born. Yeah, but apparently uh, her parents started following Islam around the same time she achieved puberty. You know, using the Muslim logic of Genesis here, you got two things that must happen at the same time. So I guess she achieved puberty while she was in the womb. Okay, so John Smith made a reference that is hilarious. Um, He said that the uh, exposition of Nikah misses the famous shaitan example so if you do not say the bismillah before you have intercourse with your wife you will have a shaitan jump onto your member and enter your wife instead of you and so whenever that that would be uh and sawati you knock yourself out and do it so that would be the uh the nikah of the uh of the shaitan in that case so yeah, that's yeah. That that clearly means the process of of marriage. If if you yeah, don't, if you don't say the magic right. words, it then means going to marry your wife. Yes, yeah. <laughs> but there are quite there are quite details uh, details about what in which way he he has intercourse with your wife. That is not that's not marriage. That's intercourse. So uh, let's yeah. go ahead and move yeah, on. Get back to the yeah. Get back to the presentation. <laughs> And we can skip to the next page. Yep. So there's only one reference at all in the New Testament to the age of marriage. Because again, people didn't actually need to be told this explicitly. Um, It's just lumped into the whole immorality thing and indecency thing. 
So in fifth, First Corinthians seven thirty six, in the King James Version, for instance, but if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely towards his virgin, if she passes the flower of her age, and need so require, let him do what he will, he sinneth not, let them marry. So this is about marrying when past the flower of her age. And it's a little bit unclear here because the word is hyperachmos. And so achmos means bloom. Hyper means beyond. So it's beyond the bloom or beyond the peak of youth. So it's beyond the peak. And unless you're like a crazy person who thinks that nine-year-olds are the peak of youth, uh, ew. Uh, but this has a context in the culture. There's a little bit uncertainty here about whether or not it certainly replies to the woman or to the man, if it's talking about whether or not, but it would only be applicable to the circumstance if it is talking to the woman. So the Akmos is used by Plato for the prime of life and by uh, Eustathius as well. Um, the the uh, Akmos of, of woman is defined by Plato to be 20 years and that of a man at 30, Diodorus uh, Silicus, um, he talks about how there is the, uh, the, the maximum or the uh, bloom of the height or bloom of the age or stature of a woman. So this would imply that she's fully grown to her maximum height in the way that it's being used. It's, uh, he also uses it as a virgin. Um, and another, uh, another Greek, Diogenes Laertes, uh, tells of the pity that is felt for the father of a virgin who, because of the smallness of her dowry, goes beyond the prime of her age uh, without being married. Excellent. Oh. I had to fix something. Uh, all right. So there are some christian views on the age of rebecca and all of them just see her as an image of the church um she was seen as a type of the church whose covenant was made with water as she was at the well um she's a virgin young woman of marriageable age one who came from afar and who was yet known to god the source of the future christ and also the image of christ's bride so all of this is just how christians saw it they didn't go let us find out the age of, Re of Rebecca and then from that determine when we should all get married. And again, it's very obvious that she's an adult young woman, right? So Jerome, Gregory of Nyssa, Chrysostomum, Augustine, Tertullian, C uh, Cyril of Jerusalem, Ambrose, Caesarius, Arles, and Ephraim the Syrian all agreed with that. And then, um, just for one moment. So we also have uh, we also have an a late apocrypha that has some sources about this, right? And um, this is because I looked for everything, like any tradition whatsoever that talks at all about how old Rebecca was in any sort of way. It just was not something that ever came up, right? So this is the only thing in Christian tradition that says anything about the age of uh, of Rebecca. And this apocryphal book, which is just like this this collection of legends and stories that developed in the Middle Ages about Rebecca. You know, this is. 3,000 years after she lived, said that uh, three years after Sarah's death and Isaac's fourth year, Rabek, that's uh, the, the Armenian word named Rebecca, uh, his wife was brought from Haran, daughter of Bethuel, son of Nahor, Abraham's brother, and for 20 years Isaac did not draw near to her on account of his modesty, meaning chastity, for he was a likeness and type of Christ. So you see here that the Christian view is quite the opposite extreme that like it's good even to uh, even to hold back from fulfilling this marriage until this point just to imitate Christ and his uh, purity and self-control more fully, right? So that would be a Christian tradition, the only Christian tradition that exists that says anything about this explicitly. 
Um, so, so here you go. Here is the contrast between Mohammed having intercourse with a nine-year-old and this tradition saying that Isaac just did not have intercourse with her for 20 years because uh, that's when there was a prayer to God for them to have children, actually. And uh, the actual biblical source says that she's uh, that she was infertile to this point, or they were both infertile to this point, but they're taking this not as an infertility, but as a uh, decision not to have uh, intercourse at all, is how it's being read here. And of course, since this comes from Apocrypha, we know that this is actually the literal words of Allah, because that <laughs> is what Muhammad copied and pasted into the Quran, <laughs> is various apocryphal sources. So this is Solid gold material in, in Islam here. This is as definitive as it gets. And oh, look, uh, Rebecca is definitely not nine years old. Yep, yep, that's special. All right, so we can move on now that we've covered all the all the materials that are about this, you know, within the Bible. And now we've gone straight all the way to Christian Apocrypha. So the rabbis understood that the state of Na'ara began at the age of 12 years and one day. Uh, if there are also signs of puberty, if they're not signs of puberty, then she's not a Na'ara. Before that, a female is a katana, that just means a little one, and she cannot be called a Na'ara. This place is a hard minimum of 12 over, for Rebecca, according to the biblical text, because of what the rabbi said. So Rebecca had to be 12 years in a day. And in fact, it's actually more extreme than that. I don't know whether or not I, I even put, I think I just forgot to put it on there. Um, but she had to be uh, 12 years and six months minimum to be called a Betula. So she had to be older than that and have more signs of puberty, right? Um, yes, and that does just mean a small, a little one, a, f a female little one. So, um, Sawati, I don't think that there's a mirror veil on your intellect. I think that your mother dropped you on your head. She should not have done that. So. And I'll, I'll just point out that, you know, if 12 years and one day is the minimum age for marriage in, in Jewish tradition, that's to start the marriage process. Traditionally, oh, that... it takes a year or, so, or more of betrothal before you're actually married. Uh, so no one would be younger than 13. Well, that is that is now um, the the rabbis did say some ridiculous things in the period after rejecting Jesus. They had some magic magic of reinterpretation stuff that they did, but we don't care about any of that. According to the rabbis, according to the rabbis, Rebecca had to be at least twelve and a half to be in the age of uh, Betula. That's it. So you can't get down to a, a nine-year-old. You just can't do it. And also more signs of puberty. So um, I do not particularly care what the Talmud says about the ages of marriage. That has nothing to do with us. That has nothing to do with this text. And the, the rabbis could say whatever they liked. And it doesn't change what actual history was. So... Uh, next, Sawati, I think that you are an Indian and don't know Arabic at all. I really do. So, yeah, you know, uh, be before you move on. Yep, go ahead. Uh, just because Allah gives great respect to the Talmud, just because Muhammad declares in a, a particular hadith that a sentence from the Talmud is Allah's speech and found in his book, a sentence that is not found in the Quran, thus saying that the Talmud is, is Allah's book, just because uh, he says that doesn't mean that Christians believe in the Talmud. And you often tell us, oh, your Gospels are written way too late. You can't believe them. They were written a hundred years or more after the time of Jesus. Well, first of all, that's inaccurate because you don't know how a calendar works and you assume that Jesus uh, died in the year zero, apparently. Uh, but, but ignoring that, when was the Talmud collected? And that would be, started to be collected around 250 and the, the main Talmud, uh, the main commentary is not till 450. So that's 400. And 50 years after the time of Jesus and 3,000 years after the time of Rebecca and now you're telling us that's a reliable source that's the source that we should go to to look for information amazing stuff here 
So the earliest of the extra biblical sources that exists is the book of Ju Jubilees. And this is again apocrypha, it's not authoritative, it's not from God, but it is the earliest source that has any tradition that has a specific age, and she is 14 in this uh, particular book. And this seemed to have been very influential because she is 14 um, in all of these varied, uh, in all of these uh, various early sources. So we have uh, the, the Book of Jubilees basically gave this like elaborate timeline for everything and um, uh, for the history of the world and the ages of the patriarchs and everything. It was trying to recast things in this uh, Sadducee influenced uh, framework. And so it gave ages for everybody and everything and time periods for everybody and everything. Conflicts with the biblical narrative, whatever. It's not inspired. It's not from God. But this is the earliest source, and it causes her to be 14 when they married. Um, and so because, I guess, because of the influence of the Book of Jubilees, she's 14 in a whole bunch of different sources, even if she is a different year at the time of her death. So we can move on, I think. Yeah, and I would just say, you know, 14 is a reasonable guess. It's not definitive, but it's a reasonable guess. Yeah, and in that in that era, in that time, fourteen is not an outrageous age for marriage. Um, we can say now that people shouldn't, that girls should not be marrying at fourteen, while also saying that it was fine in that context then, because uh, fourteen you had you know a legal status as an adult, you had the skills of an adult, whereas now you can't work full time at fourteen. You shouldn't be married if you can't even work full time, right? It just doesn't. You have to be able to take on the task of an adult to be married. It's it's pretty simple. So. Um, we have here uh, some extra big biblical sources um, that are even later, that are considerably later than this. Um, we have one from 300 AD-ish that was very influential too and was quoted many different times. It says six pairs, there were six pairs whose years of life were the same. And it pairs Rikva, that's Rebecca with Kahoth. Now, Kahoth was 133 when he died, and that would. Uh, there are two different weird traditions about Jacob's life, and they they still all add up to the same narrative. Either she had 20 infertile years, as it says in the Bible, and then they kind of attack on this these two extra years in this other place for the age of Jacob at her death, and then. Uh, that still makes her 14. The alternative tradition, this is all pretty complicated. And I have I have l laid all this out in my documents about this, um, uh, that these two conflicting things, but it still makes her 14 when she got married again. Um, and in fact, like if you, the... Uh, if you take out those extra those extra buffer years, that would actually make her 16 rather than 14. So it would make her older rather than younger. So um, the uh, a very early ed legend that became quite popular said that Rebecca was born when Isaac was bound um, at that very moment, and that was just like this this random legend that sprouted up among the Jews in like the 300s. And this appears in uh, Seder Olam Rabbah 1 and Bereshit Rabbah 56, 8, which connects uh, Isaac being 26 to the binding of Isaac or uh, Rebecca being 14 because of the binding of Isaac in some way. So if you go to these sources, you will get um, uh, the early we have two variants that exist in this, but the early one, uh, the early ones that still survive in various places, uh, still support this 14. And then we'll find out why other things came out in just a moment. So the brand new legend came around in AD 830. Um, there was an existing story that said that Satan, uh, Samael, went to Abraham and Isaac and told them to go against God regarding the binding of, of Isaac. You know, just God doesn't know what he's talking about. Don't do this. He's going to die. And they refuse him. Then there's this new tradition that was just written by a new legend written in Italy that says that after he was rejected by Isaac and uh, Rebecca and I, or excuse me, after he was re rejected, 
by Abraham and Isaac, he went to uh, to Sarah and told her that her son had been killed. And so she died of grief on the spot. So now all, all of a sudden that would force Isaac to be 37 at the time of the binding because of this brand new legend that was just made up. There was the existing tradition that Rebecca was born at the moment of binding. And that's where you would suddenly get, if you try to make all these things work together, she'd somehow be three, which again is absolutely ridiculous. When you look at the text, the words that are used of her, the previous traditions about her age, the previous traditions about Isaac's age, it doesn't work. However, the uh, this particular writing was so popular that it influenced other uh, that it it really influenced this really fantastical uh, masach uh, kecht sofarim, um, which is even later than that, which has all these crazy stories about how Eleazar, the servant of uh, Abraham, was so giant that he in fact had a tooth that fell out and it became a uh that became a plate that was used uh for by abraham to put uh to eat out of and his bed was you know 50 yards long and all these crazy stories in there also was the first time they explicitly said that rebecca was three and this this even later more insane legend uh, somehow influenced earlier copies of Seder Olam Rabbah and Bereshit Rabbah uh, 56.8, which caused variants to emerge, sometimes conflicting within the same text. Like it will say Isaac, or it will say like, Isaac was 37, therefore Rebecca was 14, which is just weird, right? Um, it just makes no sense uh, for that to be a therefore. So uh, then you would got... Uh, Rashi, who was a well-respected rabbi in 1,400, or excuse me, uh, what, 1,040, so A.D., which is 3,000 years after Rebecca, suddenly says, sure, first one to say, sorry, she was three. Definitely three. You guys are all wrong. Clearly she was three, right? But he makes this work by saying that the marriage was not consummated until she was 13 because Rashi at this time was in a group who were starting to teach that the uh, patriarchs had followed all the mitzvah. So all the rules the rabbis had made up in the last thousand years, the patriarchs really followed them in some way. So they were using their own little miracle of reinterpretation and you would have to divorce a wife if after 10 years you couldn't have kids together you're supposed to divorce and he said well there are two things first you should never have intercourse with a woman you know with your your wife if you have a a contracted marriage then you should not have intercourse with your wife if she is not you know if that would cause any harm to her well clearly it would cause harm to have intercourse with a three-year-old therefore Isaac never would have done that. And so she is now, you know, she was 13 when they actually had intercourse in that way. There were only 10 years of the infertility before he prayed to God. And then he actually followed all the mitzvah. So it's this kind of uh, shifting everything to make it fit. But the very important thing here is whenever Rashi said she was three when they married, he does not mean consummation. He says that they were 13, she was 13 when they consummated. And this was, Rashi here was willing to accept all kinds of stories about, he, he was absolutely willing to believe that the patriarchs, you know, were giants and grew up really fast. And, you know, like uh, the, the fairy tales that you read, like he, they gave birth to a child and then she grew into whatever and immediately said such and such, like those kinds of stories. He was willing to accept these. So he had no problem with her. Both being three and also being uh, uh, Na'ara, but then would say, well, she was three in some ways to his version. And so, you know, he was he was OK with all of these these conflicting things. But later rabbis were just like, no, we, we can't be doing this. This is embarrassing. Um, let's just get rid of the tradition that she was born at the moment that Isaac was bound and everything lines up again. And it works. She's uh, 14. Uh, yes, this rabbi lived in France. So this rabbi lived in France uh, one th or 3,000 years after Rebecca, and he was influenced by an Italian story. 
that was made up in uh, just 200 years before that. So it was this brand new crazy story and other rabbis kind of covered for it and were just like, okay, let's just kind of go, no, we're not, we're not doing this anymore. We're not, we're not making this claim. This is just ridiculous because you would have to say, you would have to like explicitly say that there's some sort of accelerated aging for these patriarchs and make that part of your doctrine. Or you have to say that the Bible is wrong to call her a Na'ara and a Betula by their own definitions. And they didn't want to do either of those, uh, either of those things. So they just said, no, she was not born at the moment of binding. That's just something that crept in and we don't accept that anymore. So let's... Yes. It's, so we'll, we'll get to the conclusion here. And uh, yes. the conclusion is, so it was taken from the rabbis. And yes, that is more or less the conclusion. I've had Muslims sometimes, usually they have no clue, of course, but mm -hmm. sometimes they'll, they'll quote a little math formula that they copied and pasted somewhere. And other times they'll quote a public domain Jewish encyclopedia, a couple words out of it that says, according to so-and-so, she was three. And then they'll, they'll ignore the rest of the same encyclopedia entry, which gives various other ages, according to different people. And they're like, see, this is proof she was three. Right, right. And remember that this entire tradition came from the conflict between all of these legends, the last of which was made up in AD 830 and has a servant so huge that he could hold uh, Abraham, who was himself a giant, on his hand, and uh, you know his tooth fell out and was made into a dinner plate. Like, this is a source for this. This is the quality of material we're dealing with here, right? Um, so, just in conclusion, the biblical text describes her as an adult. The Bible has no knowledge of prepubescent marriage. It's just not a thing in the biblical context. Um, the earliest extra biblical traditions make her 14. They are not authoritative, but it's fine. That actually works with the context, right? Um, the accretion of these contradictory, crazy legends introduced a series of events that led to her being assigned to the age of three in some sources in the ninth century, 3,000 years after she lived. So one flu influential rabbi in the 11th century was taken in by these sources, but he nevertheless said she was 13 at consummation. So he rejects the consummation at such a young age. Um, the rabbi was corrected by other, even later rabbis, and their correction is considered authoritative. So even if you are a Jew, you would consider the correction to be authoritative. Um, even taking into account this ridiculous and impossible age, uh, Rashi still believed the marriage wasn't consummated until she was 13. So that is there's a huge difference between 13 and 9. You know, would say 13 is whoa, way too young now. But in the context of ancient times, that was not considered ridiculous in most cultures. 9 was. 9 was. So why would they make these kind of legends? There is just this tradition among rabbis to make up what's called uh, midrashim. And they are these explanatory stories from which these moral truths are supposed to be uh, derived. There's a saying about them that only a fool disregards them, but a greater fool takes them as literal, which is one of the reasons why his Rashi's peculiarly literal reading of these legends and midrashes were, was rejected because, you know, you're not supposed supposed to take them in that way literally even though you are supposed to kind of make them work together with the text you're not supposed to take them like absolutely literally at all so it's it's just kind of this odd thing that's come that that is emerged from just rabbinical tradition after the rejection of christ this did not exist at the time of jesus this has this is an independent development of the reaction of Judaism to Christ and to the destruction of the temple that emerged from in that context from that period and has nothing to do with Christianity and is its own separate thing anyway. So if uh, anybody wants to come up now, now is the time. Yes, so I, I've posted the link for any Muslim who wants to come up in dispute. Uh, I'll just add that 
uh, in case it wasn't clear, the the legend didn't intentionally make Rebecca three. It was just kind of a consequence of them inventing a bunch of stuff, uh, and right. it, it just kind of ended up that way. When you added multiple different legends together, it wasn't anyone intentionally making that or, or that age. And I'll also say that. Uh, you know, you said this didn't exist at the time of Jesus. It didn't even exist at the time of Muhammad. This, this legend hadn't even invented, no. been invented yet then. So it's just totally ridiculous to take this as trustworthy. Do have yeah. a number? Well, yeah, yeah. No, no one would have deliberately made her three in their legends because that conflicted with the basic understanding of what the meaning of the words were that describe her. She cannot be under 12 and a half according to the rabbinical understanding of the text and the rabbis believe that their understanding was absolutely correct as a group infallible so that would mean that you would have them asserting you know that their their interpretation of all these words is actually wrong when they're claiming infallibility for it because they're also claiming something contradictory. So it is absolutely incidental to all of these crazy legends coming together at once to create this perfect storm of weirdness that causes her to end up being three when these different legends interact, not even the same legend in the same place. I am Indeed. going to run for just a second and grab some uh, antihistamine because I am dying of an allergy attack here. <laughs> Uh, no worries, no worries. So I had, have saved a number of questions. If you have other questions related to today's topic, feel free to post those now. Uh, we'll be happy to take some comments and questions. And a reminder, I posted the link for any Muslim who wants to come up live. Swati was silent for a while, but he just posted again, so I know he's here. We'll see if he has the guts to come up and talk to us live today. Now, Watchman said, where have we heard this before? Pretending that people hundreds or thousands of years earlier were following a later invention? Oh, yes, Islam. Such nonsense. This is probably where they got the Adam being 90 feet tall. And indeed, you guessed correctly, the legend of Adam being 90 feet tall derives from Jewish legends, just like much of the Hadith and especially much of the Quran. The original authors of Islam seemed to be very interested in these Jewish legends. Problem was they had no discernment of which ones were even accepted by Judaism. They just took all these stories, assumed they were all true, even ones that that no one believed were true, that they were intentionally written to be fictional bedtime stories to children, if you will. Uh, Muhammad seemed to think that they were valid sources of information. Then he remembered that information. He got a revelation revealing that information. And he apparently thought that he was revealing the same thing as what the Bible taught. The problem was he didn't actually have a Bible. He was only relying on oral testimony of people telling these stories. And he didn't know the difference between what's found in the biblical text and what was purely legendary. Uh, such a shame. Swati is on duty at the moment. Not possible for him to call in. Uh, just like last time when it was... 9 a.m. or 10 a.m., whatever he said, as his excuse why he couldn't call in. Just such a shame that he never seems to... He's always available for the chat, but never available to call in for some strange reason. So just some comments that I took throughout, saved throughout. Uh, Joshua says, if Rebecca was three, then she's very strong and a smart girl to be able to carry large water jugs as well as looking after a flock of sheep. Indeed. But Swati disputes, he says, that uh, fixing the age of marriage is the idea of your liberal society. When it came to religion, as soon as she reached the age of puberty, she must get married. So uh, That is nonsense. <laughs> so we, a number of questions were asked of Swati, because he seems to think that, you know, you, you just one day randomly you become puberty. So, you know, how do you define that, Swati? Uh, is it the beginning of puberty? And do you actually mean must? I I asked you these things in chat. Other people asked me in this chat. For some reason, you failed to nail down anything. I wonder why. Perhaps because you know this is nonsense. Uh, I do agree that there isn't necessarily the same age that's appropriate for everyone. The appropriate age is when you've reached 
physical and mental maturity and you are capable of making that decision for some people you know that might be 16 other people it might have happened to 25 but uh you know for modern society where people age slower uh, at least mentally um, because they're not thrust into situations where they have to act like an adult while they're still a child and yes by the way these uh these tum uh late uh, rabbinical traditions are indeed where you start seeing that uh, Abraham was also a giant and things like that. That predates Islam to a little bit. It's from these odd rabbinical sources. Uh, so yes, that's yet another thing that Muhammad actually accidentally copied from the wrong source. And he thought that the ra rabbis were all prophets, apparently. Very interesting. <laughs> so uh, I have done an entire uh, genealogy of my family, right? So I know the ages of marriage of everyone. And for those who didn't have like an arranged marriage, the marriage would be arranged, but the consummation would be delayed for a long time. So accepting that in the entirety of the history of my family, you have the youngest marriage that occurred was 15, several 15 year olds married. You don't even have a 14 year old and the, the history of my family back to, you know, the, wherever, wherever it was traceable to the Middle Ages. So, uh, you know, if you go to everybody, everybody's descendant from royals. I'm not special being descendant from royals. If you can trace it back, you'll hit a royal because their kids survived. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you go there and you'll find early arranged marriages. Uh, yes, absolutely. But I have no problem with it. I mean, like, there's no need for arranged marriage today, but an early arranged marriage, sure. But what matters is the consummation and when you're living as adult couple together and that is not appropriate for small children and in fact it's really funny because Romeo and Juliet was supposed to be ultra ultra scandalous and the reason that the entire thing is kind of set in this exotic uh, the exotic land of Italy is that you could imagine these violent Italians who had all of these evil, you know, who had all these terrible uh, feuds going on, these blood feuds, these exotic blood feuds, and they're kind of primitive and backwards. They might have a 13 year old getting married. That's how old uh, uh, Juliet is in the story. And the moral of that story is that this whole tragedy happened for two reasons. And the first reason was that uh, Juliet or that the family's refuting, of course, and that's primitive and terrible. But the second reason was that Juliet was too young for marriage. And because she was young and, you know, having her first fluttering feelings of emotion, et cetera, et cetera, her first love, she just didn't have a any perspective on anything and she was irrational and this was like a warning against encouraging people below a, a respectable age for marriage to be interested in um in marriage and in one another so the we the society in early 1600s in england would look askance at a 13 year old getting married and go Ugh, that's like not really okay. Yeah, you're getting your first crushes in, but Mary, ugh, no, this is happening because of these wrong choices that the adults made to put a girl in a situation where she's thinking about marriage and love when she should still be a child. That is the moral for the grown-ups in the room whenever you see Romeo and Juliet. There's an, a whole introduction about the feud and about the women, uh, about how, you know, pushing a girl into marriage ru is ruinous. It's a bad idea. And Juliet's father, those words are put in his mouth for a reason. So, no, this is not like, oh, this is something that came out of the, I don't know, 20th century liberal society. No. It's, it's ancient. It was technically legal to marry then because you had a choice. If a girl ended up pregnant with her boyfriend at 12. That's why the minimum age of, was usually 12, because then you could possibly get pregnant. Her life would have been destroyed if she could not marry and would be a single mother for the rest of her life. And so to have the ability to have, in the cases of 
consensual intercourse that people shouldn't really be doing, you know, you needed to have a provision to allow society to deal with that in the context of those times and what the repercussions would be if you couldn't. So you can have a shotgun marriage <laughs> with, if, uh, you know, the 16 year old gets a 12 year old pregnant, it's like, look, you're responsible, dude. And that is how you could do that in the framework of society. That did not mean that people thought that people getting married at 12 was any kind of good idea that was smart, that that was what should happen. There are all kinds of examples of people who uh, who were uh, the bishop interfering or the Lord interfering whenever people try to get marriages of young heiresses to people or get girls married when they're too young like authorities intervened even though it was technically legal and even though she technically gave her consent we have instances where the local lord brings in his people kidnaps the girl who is 12 and a half and is just like no this is not happening here goes before the court um convinces you know convinces her look you've been uh, confused and flattered and everything else and she goes wow i really am not ready to be married at 12 years old where she had been previously manipulated so and then the marriage had been annulled so even whenever you talk about technical legality the view of society towards something that is technically legal for the purpose of preventing a greater harm does not reflect what society actually encourages so I hope that this is clear to people who are understanding so that people can understand the difference between what's technically allowable and what society thinks is decent and good and pure and a good idea and everything else. Um, I do want to give very briefly a couple of good examples um, from the uh, the marriages of royalty because royals were often married off very young without their without their consent they were arranged marriages but later uh, later it would be consummated so um, one example cannot remember the king at the moment I should have looked it up ahead of time um, the king had arranged for the crown prince and he, to marry a princess he was like two years older than her she pops up pregnant at 14 and the king is so outraged at the lack of self-control of the husband that he separates them for the next four years because he said you know his his opinion was that you have endangered her health and her welfare just because you can't keep it in your pants and that is you know in in the ideal uh of the christian context that even if you were married and technically cohabitating there was an expectation of waiting until it is wise especially if you are the prince who's supposed to lead a country and keep it in your pants until you're both really mature enough. And yeah, he took that he sent away the wife and the husband to opposite castles on different sides of the country for like four years after that point because he was so outraged at her being pregnant at 14 because he's like, you know, you've endangered her life. Um, another example is uh, Richard II, I believe, marrying Isabella Valois. And she was nine and he was in his 30s when they married. And they go, oh, look at that. She was nine, too. Or no, I think she may have been seven. And uh, isn't that perverted, too? Well, they miss the entire point. Um, Richard II wa had previously had a wife whom he loved very much. And she had died without any children. So he had no heirs. He had no one to follow him. And he didn't want to remarry. He didn't want to have intercourse with another woman. He was still desperately in love with his dead wife. And he pushed back against the uh, nobles for a while. And then eventually he's like, fine, fine. I'll marry. You want me to marry? I'll marry. I'm sending a delegation now, I declare, to the king to marry his seven-year-old daughter. And the nobles couldn't say no because it was an appropriate marriage. And, but they were like, okay, surely she will say no. Surely she won't want to be married to this man. But she said, I would very much like to be queen. Thank you very much. That will be fine. And she came across. She was put in. They got married. She was put in a castle, given a governess. The marriage was not consummated. And he died a number of years later, unsurprisingly, in a baron's revolt. They killed him um, because he was not doing his duty as a king and was using this marriage as the excuse not to do what he was supposed to be doing. And uh, she, the marriage had never been consummated. And I believe she was like, 
oh, I forget her age then. She was somewhere between like 11 and 13 in that time. And she eventually married someone else and, and had uh, an actual marriage after that. But he, when he, you know, he rarely visited her. When he did, he treated her as a child and not as a wife in any way, which also enraged all the barons for obvious reasons. So his little gambit in the long run got him killed. But the entire thing was he was not going to have intercourse. He had an excuse. He could delay it until she was at least 15 and no one could tell him that he was not making the right decision for delaying the consummation until she was, you know, a minimum of 15. So he bought all this time where he didn't have to, in his mind, betray his wife's memory. Um, very loving man, very terrible king. So if anyone else wants to come up and talk about this, uh, no, I'll, Al Fanon, I gave explicitly accurate information. If you have difficulty in comprehension, I'm afraid it is because uh, uh, of Islam and Allah does things to people's heads. So you can go back and you can see that I did not say that there was an explicit age. Rather, I said that in the rabbinical traditions that emerged later about the minimum ages assigned to words, that there was a minimum age. That she was that she had to have been, and also in the traditions that were apocryphal that emerged later, there was an age for Rebecca. These are apocryphal sources; we don't take them. But if you're running off to extra biblical, biblical apocryphal sources, then you have to consider all of them. And the earliest ones say she was 14, so you can't go to one that's a thousand years later and say, "Oh, that one must be authoritative over the." previous thousand years of the manuscript tradition so indeed so uh alfanon is almost certainly like 99.9 percent .9 certain <laughs> that this is uh jason Bourne, aka alonzo harris aka the world aka so on and so forth that i've blocked 23 times i believe it's soon to be 24 but no worries we're going to answer his questions today or uh, his accusations more accurately. Uh, he so said, no, well, I mean, he's just, he, he continued there. He's just lying more. Um, either he is uh, learning impaired and is, is having difficulties in his intelligence. Um, perhaps Allah cursed him uh, or else he is lying. So which is it? Uh, which is it, al uh, are, yeah, yeah. are you stupid or are you a liar? Because it's one or the other. So you said you made up a minimum age for marriage and consummation that is not in the Bible. Uh, well, you weren't here the whole time, so how would you know what we said? Oh, right. You just came in here and are just making accusations. You have no idea what we said. Uh, we're not going to repeat it. Well, you could go ahead and watch the whole thing. And I, I guarantee you'll never find anywhere in there where we gave any specific minimum age for marriage. However, are you saying that there is a minimum age in Islam or not? Is the minimum age zero? Uh, or is there a minimum age in Islam? I'd like you to answer that. Second, you said you made up an age, not us. Well, I already said we didn't make up an age. And it was Muslims who tell us that Rebecca is three, not Christians, not Jews, not atheists. It's Muslims who come in here and say over and over again, Rebecca was three. So if those people aren't Muslims, then great. Uh, you just made a bunch more apostates, which... I mean, most people are apostates because they actually cannot accept all of Muhammad's commands without any question in their heart, which makes them ex-Muslims. To which I will put up this comment from earlier from Kento, ex-Muslim lives matter. So uh, give me the age that I explicitly said that the Bible teaches Al-Fanon. Give it to me since I said that. So Al-Fanon, what is the age? Since you made a, uh, uh, a statement, and by the way, App Frenzy, um, or Appy Frenzy, um, I just didn't include it in this. I actually have that covered in my complete coverage as a, uh, an appendix, my complete coverage of the subject. Um, actually, could you uh, link to that? Yep, uh, I'll add a link. In yeah, add a, add a link to, uh, and oh. we'll have a link to my document that is the exhaustive excruciatingly exhaustive coverage of the age 
of Rebecca with an appendix on the age of Mary. Again, nothing is given about the age of Mary in the uh, biblical text. You know that she's a legal adult because she's able to travel by herself. But uh, nothing is, is given about that. So, yeah, take a look. It has my this presentation in it, and it also has a uh, the very long PDF with lots and lots of detail. So Alvon keeps insisting that we didn't make any criteria, but he didn't watch the presentation, so he doesn't know. Again, go back and watch. You will see. He said that there's no biological criteria given in the Bible. Well, I, if you if you go and bother to watch this, and no, it's a there's no criteria for age in the Bible. It's a biological and and's mental state. Stop lying to your audience. Um, did we say that it was a biological and mental state in? Yes, we did. Did we say there was a specific age? No, we did not. So Alphonne, and instead of pretending like you know what we said and calling us liars, how about you stop commenting and go and actually watch the presentation? Oh, he claims he's watched it in 2X. So he needs to right now give us the explicit age that I said was the minimum age in the Bible. So, so go ahead and give me the age. I'm gonna count, I'm gonna count down with my hands from 10, and when I get to zero, if you have not put an age in there, I think it's time for you to go bye-bye. So we can keep talking about other things while I count down. Yeah, well, there's a little delay, so maybe you should give more like 30 seconds, but still. Yeah. Well, uh, whenever my whenever my hands appear, I'm watching that live stream, so I will see. Very good. Uh, so um, Boris earlier asked if Sheikh Safras is here. Do you want to he tell us what Safraz has run has been up away. To? <laughs> yeah, so Safraz has been emailing me like every couple of days. He'll and he just sends new emails. He doesn't even reply to same thread. So I have all these Safraz emails everywhere, and that is zero. So whenever my hand appears on the main screen, I'll let you know. Um, so uh, Safraz has been running away ever since he told me, and it is now on there. So he has not given. A and age. He just no. Nope. So, it, so it looks like he decided it, to lie once again. Yeah. I didn't claim you said there's a minimum age in the Bible. You did three or four yeah, times. Yeah, you did. So now you're lying about what you said. I'm saying that you're using non-biblical criteria for age, which is also not accurate. We told you. We gave many biblical reference. So guess what? Welcome to the block list for the twenty-fourth time. <laughs> so sad. So. Uh, Sawati, once again, you are a dirty, filthy liar. You, you guys are such perverts, and you're just so determined to, like, defend your perversion. It bothers me so much that, that you're just like, your perversion is so incredibly profound that you have to justify these things. So there was recently, or a few years ago, there was, before the, the war in Yemen started, a little girl in Yemen was married, and by her husband, she he had sex, because there is no such thing as marital rape in Islam, so you can't call it rape, right? He had had sex with his wife, who was a little girl, and because she was so young, he actually killed her he caused her to bleed to death she died and so they began to discuss the possibility of having an age limit and for marriage for women in Yemen and as a result of this there were enormous protests and riots against the un-Islamic practice of not allowing girls so small that they will be killed by their husbands trying to have intercourse with them um, because it is the Islamic thing to affirm that that is a proper age for marriage and it is un-Islamic to say that a little tiny girl should not be raped to death. So Indeed. Yeah. So why does it matter to us? Because it's disgusting, perverted, dangerous, physically, emotionally, mentally for the girl. And notice that there's never any interest in marrying boys uh, that are eight years old. Only mm -hmm. girls. Yep. Amazing yep. stuff. It's almost like this is a religion created by a pervert. Almost like that, huh? So. All right. So we got a few more comments here. Uh, let's see. 
Uh, earlier when Swati tried to tell us what the Talmud said incorrectly, by the way, the Talmud never says nine. It says a few different ages, mm -hmm. but never nine. And that, that's Correct. just a flat out lie. Uh, but then he says, so you don't care what the Talmud say, so you follow your own desire. Swati, you're confused here. The Talmud has this much authority in Christianity. We are not Jews. We are not rabbinic Jews following the religion of rabbinic Judaism, which was invented in the fifth century. We are Christians following the Bible, following the continuation of, of Jewish traditions from the Old Testament into the New Testament. And our only authority is the Bible itself. And also, additionally, um, the rabbis gave themselves authority over everything and the authority to perform the miracle of reinterpretation at any time. And since the time of the Talmud, the rabbis have availed themselves of their authority of the miracle of reinterpretation to, in fact, explicitly say that there is to be no child marriage. So because they have this evolving authority that they have granted themselves within the context of rabbinic Judaism, Judaism has since that time uh, said that there is to be no child marriage period. Now that's interesting because this is something that Islam cannot do because it can't get away from the perfect example of Muhammad. And once uh, the consensus has been reached by the Islamic authorities, you know, you have the, the ijma by the uh, ulama, then you're just stuck with it. That's what it's supposed to be forever. There is no miracle of reinterpretation except whenever you're lying to Christians. So the uh, what you have is you have in Muhammad's example the an absolute maximum age that you can move the minimum age to. So the traditional Muslims don't say nine, they say any age. They say she can be a baby, she can still be nursing and it's fine because there is no age. The more progressive -y Muslims say that, well, we're, we're constrained to Muhammad's example and that's nine. And they're the ones who are stricter on the age than Muhammad himself was. And Absolutely. they like children because, because they love the darkness and hate the truth. That's why they're Muslim. So I had a super chat earlier from Daniel. Isaac married Rebecca before she was even born, before Isaac was born too. <laughs> Thank you for the super chat, Daniel. Uh, uh, Daniel and I have a collaborative video coming out next week so be on the lookout for that and uh rebecca might just make it into that as well as it so happens <laughs> nice uh so so what he had a new theory here well new earlier i mean not like just now but uh the intellect comes in human being when they reach puberty where has your intellect gone so he's trying to insult someone um but Let's ignore that part, and let's just go to this first part. Do human beings receive, uh, re achieve intellectual maturity the minute they start puberty? No, no. But uh, according to Islam, that is their age of moral accountability, because before that point, they're considered so incapable of rational thought that nothing they do is at that are they actually responsible for and so that means that Aisha was married and the marriage consummated because that's what nikah means right uh, the marriage was consummated before she had the ability to be responsible for her own sins so let, let's let that sink in she is so such a child that she cannot be held responsible for her own sins and yet she's being married and it's funny because muslims will talk about how great it was that she was married because she gave all of these uh all of these narrations about muhammad and apparently allah needed to have him marry a little child who did not have the intelligence yet to be responsible for her own sins you you, you see where this is how there's a conflict here right if that's supposed to be your most reliable source for Islam and without her, Islam falls because there's not enough to hold it together. You need all these narrations and so you need this tiny child to be married off and for the marriage to be consummated too, not just married, but consummated. So, yeah. 
So I had a comment here from Full Armor Apologetics. I just want to see bold Christians n not being evangelic fishes. Thank you for that <laughs> comment. Swati says, you are lying. Which Muslim said get married to a baby? So stupid. So, so uh, Swati, before, before you answer, before you answer, Swati, if we are able to show you a Muslim who said this, what will you do? Will you admit you're wrong? Or will you just say, oh, yes, I, I knew about that. I just reject them as authoritative or, or something along those lines. So answer that question, then we'll come back and answer this question. Okay, and I'm going to update everybody on Safraz. So Safraz has been emailing me constantly and running his mouth in there, but he will not come back online um, because uh, Thaddeus has been deleting him, his stuff first specifically because of his ridiculous answer to one particular thing, but also because he agreed to debate me and then ran from it and would not set the date. So I can only conclude that in spite of his chest beating in the emails, he has decided that in fact, Muhammad is not in the Bible and is not the paraclete of John because he will not defend that. And he <laughs> rather actually believes that Muhammad is nowhere in the Bible and is not the paraclete and he's been lied to and deceived all this time and he does not believe in Islam anymore. So uh, I officially declare that Safraz is not a true Muslim anymore because he is unable to defend his Quran or his fake prophet who got squeezed by a demon in a cave. Um, he, he will make claims that it is self-evident that this is true, but he will not defend it. The, and since he was perfectly able to come on before, the only rational conclusion that you can make is that this is something that he is not capable of defending and he knows it. He knows it's not true. He knows it's a lie. So in his heart, he is already not Muslim. Hopefully he will leave Islam itself soon and stop sending me emails all the time because I just don't even read through them. <laughs> well, he can continue to waste his time. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> well, I also like like one line and I'll get back the screed. So I'm like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm spending his time nicely, I think. So Swati does not apparently comprehend English here because he was trying to do some other spam. I said to answer our question. And then he says, so show me a scholar that said that. Swati, you have to answer my question first. If we show you a Muslim scholar who said there is no minimum age in marriage up to including infants, are you going to admit you're wrong or are you going to claim otherwise because you never admit you're wrong and you're wrong all the time you're constantly wrong about everything you say and then you just repeat the same crap on the next video so i want it on the record that if we give you the source you will admit that you're wrong and that at least some muslim teach there is no minimum age for marriage so earlier watchman said Talmud and Mishrash are uninspired stories, not real. It is foolishness that the Quran puts nonsense from the Midrash as being revelation. And I would just say amen to that. And and the uh, uh, Quran is also quite clear that the rabbis are not prophets. They're not prophets. And yet, supposedly, things that they made up are supposed to be the words of Allah. You've got a bit of a conflict there. Absolutely. Comment from Marion. Rebecca was the first super toddler from the planter, planet Absurdus. I think that's probably pretty accurate there. Yep. And then there's uh, also... Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there are... Uh, I'll briefly co cover um, Mary. So there is nothing in the Bible except that Mary was an adult because she went on her own... Uh, she was out on her own recognizance, right? She was under her own authority when she went to visit her uh, her uh, aunt, or excuse me, her cousin. Why did I say aunt? Her cousin uh, uh, Elizabeth, I guess, because they were different generations. Um, and so she was uh, she was an adult in in the text, and that's all that you can say. You can just say she's an adult. You can't say anything else. Uh, there were some conflicts between Jews who were smearing Mary and Christians who were having a 
a development of their theology or doctrine rather concerning Mary. And uh, in this, part of this was about the perfect, the earliest sources that they were trying to defend was that Mary was in fact um, a virgin. And they, this elaborate story about Mary's virginity emerged in which at 12, you know, there are various proofs of her virginity that come through miraculously. And that's in my source that was, was sent in the chat earlier. But at 12, in anticipation that she would be, uh, that, that she would begin to uh, menstruate soon, uh, she had been raised in the temple and fed by angels in this story. And uh, in uh, this so she's approaching the age of menstruation. If she'd stayed in the temple while she was menstruating, then she would have defiled it. So a man was chosen to be her guardian. And so the marriage was one of, uh, of appearances only, and he was to keep her as a virgin forever. And so it doesn't even say what age Joseph was, but it says that when she was 12, you know, right before she would start to menstruate, they married, they summoned all the widows because they would be able to control themselves with a, with a young girl because they already, you know, they already had their own, uh, uh, children. So they don't need heirs. And then also if they were older, then they would have more ability to control themselves because it would be so revolting for an older man to have intercourse with someone who could be his daughter. Right. Um, and so they had summoned all the widowers to come and present themselves for the temple and through, uh, uh, the drawing of, of straws, essentially, uh, Joseph is chosen to become her guardian and they're technically betrothed, but of course there's never any intercourse. There are multiple other things that happen about later in which uh, Mary's virginity is pro proven through miracles and proven through uh, uh, the testimony of various uh, people, um, such as for example, her being selected by through, uh, through sacred means to weave uh, a new temple veil, which could only be woven by virgins, according to the story. Um, and all of this is apocrypha. But the context of the story is that Mary did not have intercourse with anyone ever, ever. And she was, she was married at 12 to put her under the guardianship before she began to menstruate, not because they were going to have intercourse. And in this early story, Mary is 14 when the angel comes to her. She is not, in fact, 12. And because this is not the Quran where Allah has to blow into Mary's vagina, um, there's no intercourse that ever happens. And in this late story, she is, you know, 14 at the time that she uh, becomes pregnant is either 14 or 15 when she gives birth. So you have this incredible conflict between the, and then the idea that Joseph was old, really old came even later. But you have this incredible conflict between Mohammed, who was a pervert wanting to have intercourse with a nine-year-old, and this story, which uses as part of its proof that uh, Mary was truly pure, that an older man would, who a decent older man would never have intercourse with such a young woman and that that would be disgusting and unthinkable. Right, perpetual virginity. That's what the story is about. It's about her perpetual virginity and that it would be so disgusting for him to have intercourse with her that his respectability itself and her youth together guaranteed that they would never be in the intercourse, even when she went through puberty. So... Uh, it's, you know, running to this that said she was 14, not 12 when she gave birth to Jesus, and when, that she was a perpetual virgin, and trying to say that this does something to rehabilitate Muhammad, it just doesn't. It makes him seem even worse, because Muhammad is so disgusting that he does what is considered unthinkable. And, and there are these kind of funny passages where Joseph, like, 
feels embarrassed that his, that Mary is pregnant and he needs to get her a midwife because they will the midwife will think that he an older man who has children who are her age would you know have intercourse with her and that's just humiliating even though they're married because that's so inappropriate and so that shows his uh, his respectability and then compare that to Muhammad who's like yeah I'm having intercourse with a nine-year-old it's like opposite spectrums so you're you're running to something that condemns Muhammad in the strongest terms to say that uh, to say that oh it's okay no no this says that he's worse even worse absolutely so Swati as predicted did not give a straight answer instead he ran away he said oh you said that Muslims said get marred to baby I said in Islam there is no age limit as soon as she reaches puberty is ready of marriage. Uh, no, that isn't what you said, and that's not what we said either. Why do you lie like this? Why are you in a religion that makes you constantly make up lies to cover up other lies? You said that in Islam it's forbidden to marry babies and that there is a minimum age uh, and that no Muslim ever said anything about getting married to babies. We said we can show that you're wrong, that marriage is not tied to puberty, that it is independent of it, that yes, many Muslims do say you have to be nine, but that's only because of the example of Muhammad. It has nothing to do with puberty. Only liberal Muslims in the West who are embarrassed by the story say it has anything to do with puberty and try to pretend that Aisha had reached puberty. Traditional Muslims had no problem with her being underage, not reaching puberty because he's the perfect example. So he did it, it's fine. And for that reason, some Muslims say you have to be nine, but only because of his example, not because of anything else. Other people say it's ideal to wait till she's nine because that's what Muhammad did, but it's only ideal. You can get married at whatever age you want and you can do whatever you want with the, the woman as well. But he, he, will, he, he won't get to see those sources, I guess, because he refuses to say that he will admit he's wrong. Yes, so he is like our, our friend Ibn Fibbin Footnote. Uh, have you been following that narrative? Yeah, yeah. So uh, our buddy uh, 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 Ibn Farouk, the, the sheikh, who is like the representative of Islam now, um, who relies on a typo in a footnote and claims that it is the... Uh, that he claims that it is actually the uh, hadith to prove his point. And just like him, Sawati here is showing his true Islamic colors uh, to rely on a single mistranslation that is corrected in all the other sources to make a baseless claim that conflicts with all the other sources, all the other evidence, all, everything else in Islam, all the schools of fiqh. Every Sharia authoritative ruling that has ever been made on the subject by important bodies of uh, religious scholars, the unanimous agreement of Islamic scholars up to the 20th century, he disagrees with all of this on the basis of a single mistranslation. Um, it's really a, a stunning, stunning level of either stupidity or dishonesty. Um, I don't know whether or not he just thinks that we're going to be as stupid as Muslims are who say that, oh, Rebecca was three. They actually believe that, that we just are going to be suckers. And we're not. We don't buy ridiculous lies and just repeat things because we have heard it before. You actually have to have real sources, real authority, and you need to bring something of some substance. So we are not deliberately stupid to smooth over things in our religion. That is not a part of our belief system. It's only a part of Islam where you are compelled to be dense, to make Islam less offensive to people who would otherwise revile it. Absolutely. So this was actually the original comment of Alonzo before he got blocked again. And he said, this is very poor. The whole story of Rebecca giving 10 camels water is made up. It takes more than 10 hours to give 10 camels from a wall and walking to the well and back. Um, that's some pretty interesting logic there. 
that it must be made up because it supposedly takes 10 hours. Does the text say that this was done in five minutes? No. Does it say it was done in an hour? No, it doesn't say how long it took. All it says is that Rebecca drew the water and when the camels were satisfied, that's when she had the conversation. It doesn't say anything about the length of time. So, yeah, you, you first of all, I, I seriously doubt it would take 10 hours to draw the amount of water if it's, I mean, it depends on how far you have to walk, obviously, for each one, but I seriously doubt it would take that long for a uh, physically mature, st a strong young woman to draw that much water. Maybe if she was actually three, it would take her 10 hours. I don't know. But <laughs> so I just wanted to put that up. Any uh, thoughts you have on that? Well, funny that you should ask because um, I'm cheap right now and I'm not having my my uh, septic system redone like I need to. So I have been, whenever I take a really big deep bath, I've been hauling out the water by hand. So I actually have a fair amount of idea of how long it would take to go down some steps in a decent distance to something um, with a very huge bathtub and uh, how long that, that would take. Now to empty about a, uh, I don't know, 60 gallon bathtub, because again, I really like my deep water, um, that takes me approximately 10 minutes. And I go from the back of the house through my, you know, through the ba bedroom, through the dressing room, um, you know, bathroom, dressing room, bedroom, into the hall, down the stairs, out the door, and then throw it out because like I said I'm cheap I swear I'm a better landlady than I am with my own stuff <laughs> but I would not do this to other people that takes me about 10 minutes to empty about 60 gallons so a hundred and you know it take me it take half an hour to empty it with the same amount of water that you know it's about two and a half gallons that's about the same size of water that they had then and it would not exhaust me or anything it would just be a bit of a tedious task for 30 minutes to do so uh, actually, I do happen to know exactly how much time it would take to get that 150 gallons of water, maybe half an hour. So it's kind of odd that he would make such a, a silly, aggressive claim. But of course, he is a silly, aggressive woman. Absolutely. Woman, man. <laughs> I was just going to let, I, I caught that. Child. I was let it go. <laughs> child, yeah. is, child, child is the correct. Uh, child would be the correct one. Uh, so John, in response to that, said that I know several ladies above 60 years old that have gardens and have to water daily and do one and a half to two times what Rebecca carries. You're just being stupid and jumping and reacting very right. much. So he didn't think about it. He just made up a random number and said that the story has to be a lie because of that. Yep. Uh, yep and oops, sorry. The, so Swati said... What will you do with a nine-year-old woman if you don't allow them to get married? <laughs> so Swati is admitting that a nine-year-old can be a woman in Islam. Swati, you're disgusting. Gross. No one who is nine is a woman. Again, in the, the word na'ara, which would be, you know, like a, a young woman or whatever, was considered by the uh, rabbis who had plenty of whacked out ideas but they still said that you could not be called that unless you were 12 years and a day old and also showed signs of puberty and in fact if you ask ancient people whether or not someone that young could conceive they would say no no one could be pubescent at nine it's only now in our overhead uh, overfed chubby era where kids are a bit chunky, you'll have a fair number of nine-year-olds who are entering puberty. That was not at all true then, and it doesn't make you a woman. In fact, it makes it incredibly dangerous for you to get pregnant. You are, you are likely to die. Um, in fact, there is one time in English history in which the minimal age of marriage was actually observed, and it was, the context was the middle of a civil war, and they were desperate to, one, you know, it was a war of the roses, one side was desperate to produce a legitimate heir to be able to solidify that they have a line that could continue because the other side already had one, and so a man... Uh, and his, who was like 20 years old or so, married someone who was a little bit over 12, and she had a kid at 13, and it did, you know, it nearly killed her. 
And the only reason they did that was like it was the uh, constraints of war and they were willing to do almost anything to try to gain the position to win the war. That that became her only child. She never had another one because of the injury she had suffered during birth. So even though she became the queen mother, that was her only kid. Um, their side won the war. He became the next king and everything. But, you know, that was a desperate, desperate maneuver in the context of war that nobody thought was like a good idea. It was just uh, a, a gamble that was in the context of lots of awful things happening. Absolutely. Got a couple more excuses and then we'll call it a day. Uh, yeah. Oops, sorry, not that oh, one. Oh, yeah, the, the previous did. one. Yeah, yeah I, I would not that. necessarily say jail. Um, I've got a big backyard. I think that I have I have <laughs> shovels, too. I think that that would be uh, that would be my response. So it's what he uh, actually inadvertently admitted that he knew what that Muslim scholars do say. There's no minimum age for marriage because he brought up 65-4, and he says it has absolutely nothing to do with getting married. Um, Swati, can you get divorced without getting married? Just, just, just a question for you. Just throwing that out there. And when it says that there is no waiting period in divorce unless intercourse has taken place, there's only waiting period if intercourse has taken place. So, again, uh, sicko. It is talking about a divorce that's occurring in which there is an idda, which means that there's a waiting period because there has been intercourse. No intercourse, no idda. Indeed. And last excuse by Swati for today. Don't worry, he'll be back next time giving more bad excuses, I'm sure. He said that uh, people fixed marriage at this time of birth. Did we not address arranged marriages? Yes, again, indeed. And we addressed the definition of nikah. And apparently my acting it out was a little bit too subtle for him because <laughs> he does not understand that nikah does not mean a contracted marriage, but it means a consummation. There is betrothal, there is consummation, and nikah means a consummation. Uh, we got from Buddha, Buddha, uh, getting divorced without getting married. It's a miracle of Islam. And this one isn't really an excuse from Swati, so I'll allow this to be here. Uh, to you, married mean to you, marriage mean only sex, but for us, it is not. Um, I think you got that backwards there, Swati. Uh, marriage is not about sex in Christianity. It, it includes having sex, but it's not about having sex. Whereas in Islam, the reason to get married is so that sex becomes legal. That is the only reason for marriage. For Well, I take that back. For So having sex becomes legal and having children becomes legal. Yes, and those you have recognized children. Mm -hmm. Yes, those are the two purposes of marriage in Islam is to have sex for your own enjoyment and to have sex to have children. There is no other purpose of marriage in Islam. Right. And uh, so, again, again, nikah means intercourse. It means sex. So to have nikah is to have intercourse. All of the stuff about nikah is about intercourse, and that is all it is about. Um, and... Again, you remember that I read that source, that Christian source about um, that talked about Isaac not consummating the marriage for 20 years. That would be a Christian view of marriage, a historical Christian view of something that would be permissible and allowable and uh, beneficial for some cause, at least, in marriage. Whereas there is no purpose of marriage at all unless there's intercourse going on in Islam. If you can't have intercourse with one wife, then, you know, you should get another one, period. Like, if she's sick, if she's old, if whatever, and you're still raring to go, then you should find someone else to do that. Um, uh, nikah was made 
uh, permissible in all sorts of ways in Muhammad's time to have sex with married slaves, to have sex with any uh, any female slaves, to have sex with uh, free women who contract temporary marriage, for Muhammad himself specifically to have sex with as many women as he cared to have sex with if they chose to give himself themselves to him um, and if he happened to look at a at one of his followers wives with lust they're supposed to marry give their wife to him and then the separation occurs after that so pretty much there's uh, everything in Islam on earth a huge number of things are about all the ways in which you can have sex and Allah won't be mad at you to have this degenerate prostitution oh here's a way for you to have prostitution and you sunnis don't pretend you don't have it too because miss your marriage is no different than muta um then and in the world beyond you get to have sex with even more women with a a member that will never go limp and will always constantly tear through their hymens which will regenerate so you can have the delight of tearing through them again once you've made it through the previous enormous list you know the line of women who you are always able to enjoy because your member will never go soft so just just cool it with uh, the morality the wonderfulness of islam it's it's all filthy it's all disgusting it's all about sex because it appear appeals to brutal evil caravan robber rapists the pirates of the desert basically are the ones who wrote this book and created this religion. Absolutely. Uh, Carol said the rush to get mar girls married as soon as they menstruate reeks of a need to control and be in charge of this sexual being. And that is what it's ultimately about. It's about controlling the female members of Islamic society. Final comment from Swati, when a girl reached the age of puberty is called a woman, madam, you are a liar, stupid. Swati, I know you don't know English very well, but that is not a correct statement in the English language, and it's not a sta correct statement <laughs> And physically, it's not a correct statement emotionally, it's not a sta correct statement intellectually, none of that is correct. A girl who starts puberty is called an adolescent, not a woman. And if you are even talking about ancient times that is also not true uh, in ancient times it is very typical that in almost every ancient culture that not only was puberty a requirement of marriage but so was a certain age which allowed for the possibility that someone could have a precocious puberty and not be regarded as an adult they were usually you had to have this and that for that to be considered true. So you had to, you know, yes, puberty was considered a marker of adulthood, but so was a given age. So over, I mean, almost certainly in ancient Israel, there actually was a particular age that was considered the absolute minimum because this is true in almost all societies from the Bronze Age forward. It's just not recorded because that was just within the culture. It was just embedded in the cultural understanding. Absolutely. Just a couple of funny comments to close out with. Watchman said, Allah is in my cookbook. It's right between chicken and king. And I, I just thought that was very humorous, very accurate description of Allah. Uh, Stimul 8 said, I cannot imagine the amount of frustration in dealing with people who are selectively deaf, but not mute. And that is a fantastic description of dealing with Muslim commoners on YouTube. They love to talk. They don't listen. Then they, the argument is defeated. They go away. And that's all fine, except they just repeat the same argument on the next video, having learned absolutely nothing from the fact that they were defeated, other than that they should run away and not post on that particular channel, like our good friend Safraz. Yes, Safraz, who has left Islam because he will not defend his prophet being the paraclete, as he said, that that's what, where he was. So if, if Muhammad is not in John and he cannot defend that, then Safraz has realized that Islam is a terrible lie and he's just trying to keep face now even though he knows that it's a lie and has truly in his heart left Islam. So Safraz, when you watch this, 
that is my final message to you. If you wish to debate me on this subject, I would love to do so. If you don't want to debate, then you just show that you do not have an actual belief in this at all. You just don't. You don't. Um, and you are perfectly willing to come on. You've come on multiple live streams. And since you will not defend this, you know it's a lie. And you cannot convince me otherwise unless you get your rear end up here and defend it in a structured debate so you have as much time as you like. We can make it long or short. Structured debate. I can never interrupt you. You can say all you want about all the proof in the world of what you're trying to prove. And if any other Muslim wishes to also debate whether or not Muhammad is a paraclete and John, I would be thrilled to engage with you as well. So uh, this is an open an open, oh, goodness gracious, Juad, is this another one of his accounts or is this a new person? Uh, but, I think this is probably uh, someone different. Okay. A uh, comment was made like that earlier, and I thought it was a joke, but the fact that it's being repeated makes me think that they're being serious. <laughs> what do you mean by that, that Mary is just an attention seeker? What, what about this presentation makes you think that she's seeking attention? Um, do, do let us know. We'll, we'll wait for another minute for you to clarify here. And by the way, if, if you want to come up and talk live, the link is in the chat there. Go ahead yeah. and come up and we will talk about whatever you want. Since you just joined, you probably don't know the material we present. That's fine. Come up. We'll talk about whatever you want. Go ahead and share that Mary doesn't know anything. She's just an attention seeker making up stuff about Islam, whatever you, you think. And... Uh, We'll give him a minute for it to come up, but I was going to close out on this comment from Ask Truth Apologetics, which uh, sums up the presentation today. Oh, the hikmah. And indeed, I think we have understood the actual truth of Islam today. The funny thing is, is that the word hikmah, it's actually with, with a K, not with a, not with a Q, but the word hikmah is uh, not, in fact, uh, uh, word from Islam um, or from Arabic it was a borrowed word and is almost and it the way it's used in the Quran it is almost certainly um, oh did did I get that wrong it's usually spelled with a K in other places maybe yeah I, yeah it, it's I often spelled with a K yeah maybe I just uh, misremembered what the actual Arabic is which is very possible um, but uh, I it is a borrowed word from uh, from the Aramaic and it is used as if it were an extension of the book. So what each of the prophets got was the book and the hikmah over and over and over again. So um, Jawad, by the way, I have actually contacted EF Dawa. So uh, they were looking for Christians to engage on a topic and for some odd reason they just didn't want to talk to me um i don't really listen to them very often to the jokers at ef dawa because they're they are indeed jokers but you can come and talk to us now and you can show how ignorant and stupid i am uh if i'm not then come up here uh, they wanted to talk about the uh the theology of suffering in christianity and uh and I said, oh, sure, I'll talk to you. And I filled out their little form. And for some weird reason, I guess after they saw my website <laughs> or my YouTube channel, they just don't want to talk to me. They just want to talk to ignorant Christians. So uh, come on yeah, up. Yeah, I've heard that before, strangely enough, that anyone who shows any knowledge, they, they do not let on their show. Or if they do let them on and then they figure out they have knowledge, they get rid of them in a hurry. Very strange how they're willing to take all colors and Muslims are constantly spamming. You got to call into EF Dawa. You got to call into EF Dawa, and they, the, none of these Muslims are willing to defend it for themselves. Uh, you know, EF Dawa isn't going on anyone else's channel. I think that they're just all trying to boost up that sad, pathetic little channel. If you look, they only get like 500 views on their videos. They have a bajillion subscribers, but no one ever watches their videos. Probably because people subscribed, figured out they're a total joke, even among it, Muslims, they're a total joke, and stopped watching, but forgot to unsubscribe. And and I did just check now that I hadn't lost my mind. It, it is, well, when transliterated in English, it would be translated with a K and not a Q. So I thought so. I was like, am I misremembering? So. 
My Doesn't background I, is a mystery. <laughs> well, I, I was going to actually bring that up, but it, mystery, mystery works. We'll just keep it mysterious. Yeah. It does not appear that uh, Wad is going to come up. Nope, he doesn't. He's just going to. Uh, he's just going to uh, say you should. Yeah, that's exactly what we're yeah. saying. That they're afraid but, of I knowledgeable mean, Christians. Yeah. I don't know why he's laughing at that. That's what. The, and let, so you have another explanation it's, for why they're constantly begging for Christians to come on, but they turn down anyone who shows any signs of actually having knowledge. Uh, yep, yep, because I, I, I volunteered to come up. I would love to engage on the theology of suffering in Islam because it's hilarious. Uh, I actually need to do a presentation on that sometime. Um, yeah, sorry, Phil. I was just making sure that I just like had this moment where I'm just like, what? Because um, two people said it that way. I'm like, am I having a stroke? Am I misremembering it? <laughs> but no, no, it's all right. Um, so... Uh, I, Juad, I we will engage very politely with you. We will not like scream at you, run you out. Yeah, I mean, and, I don't. You know, I've like, never, I've yeah. never seen you here before. But you can look at past streams. We've engaged with Muslims before, and I've never been mean to anyone except for one guy who instantly came on and started screaming cuss words, and he got kicked out pretty quickly. But other than that one time, never been mean to anyone. Never kicked anyone out. All I do is ask people to engage, and if they refuse to engage, I repeat the question until they do. It's all, trust me, I'm a very nice person. I, I am not going to call you names. I don't know, Mary might, but I won't be calling you any names. <laughs> I won't be doing anything mean. But I'm guessing that you, like your boys at EF Dawa, are simply too afraid to defend your religion. And it's amazing how many Muslims have the time to come and spam the chat, come have the time to come and spam the comment sections. But as soon as you ask them to come up live, other than Safraz, who is now run away scared, they're all scared and run away. It's just astonishing how all these people who have supreme confidence in the truth of Islam are unwilling to answer any questions live. They, they need time to research what their copy and paste answer is going to be, I guess. Yep. So, oh, Juad, then, if you want to, if you want to ask, I don't even know who Zuck or who's Yeah, I don't is. know who that is either, but um, tell them. But if, yeah, tell him that I would love to debate on whether or not, uh, uh, Muhammad is the paraclete of John. So if you can find any Muslim who will do that, I will debate whoever it is. Since I am just a little woman with half a brain, I am sure that any man should be able to easily defeat me with the slightest effort with my pathetic little half brain, as I would have been Halima. I would have been intelligent. But unfortunately, Eve ate the fruit and Allah cursed her to be stupid. So I am stupid. And so we need uh, we need someone to come here. And no, Mary is not a Catholic. Mary has a picture to make fun of Muhammad. It's a picture of the Virgin among virgins because Muhammad was unable to tell which Mary was a real Mary. So it's a game of find the Mary. So look at my image there. So which one's the real Mary? So that's that that's the joke. Absolutely. I don't see any other comments that we need to address. And uh, our new friend, as well as our old friends, have had plenty of time to come up live. So I think we're going to call it a day. Thank you all for joining us. Have a great rest of your week and be look on the lookout. I have a couple uh, scripted videos on their way out within the next week. And I'm also working on scheduling a live stream with Lloyd. And I have something coming up with Tony Costa as well. Have a great week. God bless.